Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome to Know Your Gear QA number 191. <laughs> so I hope everybody's having a good week. Uh, I am, <laughs> I think. It's a, it's a, it's a Friday, so we're all hanging out. I figured today's going to be a little lower audience because it's uh, Christmas, so I'm actually excited about that. Maybe we can interact a little better. Uh, that'd be kind of fun. And uh, as always, if you're new to this show and you want to ask me a question or talk to me, so I know you're talking to me and not each other, put a question mark first. That way I know to look for it. Also, uh, if you're watching the rebroadcast, I timestamp all the things we talk about in the uh, comment section and in the description down below. So you can go right to that so you don't have to watch the whole thing. And of course, you can stream this as always as a podcast. So with that being said, I uh, started the... Uh, the um, or I set up the show early, and what I did was I screen captured a bunch of questions. So I'm going to hit those first, because like I said, I like to hit the people who had the first questions. And please bear with me for a second, because like I said, I did screenshot them. But hold on, is that the first one? Let's see. Hmm. Give me a second. <laughs> It's funny. I don't remember them. Uh, I'm probably going to say them out of order. I apologize, but I have, I know there's four or five that I grabbed, but I was, tr I know which one was first, but for some reason they're not in the order. I screen grabbed them. So let's see if I can actually just go to it on the top of the page. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the first, uh, first one comes from Blake who says, Hey, what do you think of in times of deforestation and uh, destruction of nature and people working for tiny loans. Okay, I understand that. Uh, is it ethical to show off how great cheap guitars are and ad advertise them? Um, honest opinion, please. All of my opinions are going to be the honest opinions. And sadly, uh, that's just, you know, some people don't like it, but it always is that I can't, I don't have any other way to do it. Just but whatever kind of pops in my head is what comes out of my mouth. So that being said, as your question, um, what do I think of times about this? Well, first of all, I think the problem in the question is uh, the, is it ethical to show off great, and that's in quotes, cheap guitars? So you're not even saying cheap guitars are crappy guitars, you know, like highlighting that. You're saying great ones. Uh, so what I'm going to do is answer it, not even with the great. I'm going to take that out of the equation. Um, let, let's see. Let's hit two different things that I think. These are just opinions, so you're going to have to bear with me. First, you got to understand how I personally believe, and it's probably because I'm a guitar player, probably because I work in this industry. But to me, if given a choice, if a, a tree is cut down and made into a guitar, even if that guitar is a cheap guitar versus a Ikea shelf, uh, I will pick the guitar every time because uh, that I that guitar is going to last forever. Uh, cheap guitars last just as long as expensive guitars as a whole. They just require a little bit more repair and that makes them costly. But they still last. Um, uh, uh, cheap guitars sold at Sears back in the 50s and 60s still exist today on Reverb. And so think about that. Imagine if we were talking about that back uh, 50, 60 years ago saying, hey, you know, why make a cheap guitar at Sears or Montgomery Wards? Well, now they're collectible items, so they still exist. I mean, some don't, but most do. So I think the problem always with is this, is this here's the problem. This is a guitar channel where we talk about guitars and stuff. I'm sure if we had a, uh, a motorcycle quad channel, off-roading channel, we would have to talk about consuming gas and running our vehicles through uh, the, d the desert and the forest and ruining that. I think what happens is this is a luxury thing that we're dealing with here. So uh, it's always going to have a, a small aspect of evil attached to it because it's for pleasure. All of this is pleasure. None of this is needed. <laughs> this is non-necessity. So uh, the ethics of pleasure is always going to be a tough thing because I can't prove that it's, uh, you know, I can't prove without a doubt, go, oh yeah, no, we need this. We have to do these horrible things because we need to have fun, <laughs> right? Um, but the reality is we do have fun and there are worse evils out there, in my opinion, than somebody making a cheap guitar. Um, so there you go. My, my biggest question is always with cheap guitars and is this i cheap guitars are something that you guys brought out of me 
so it's not hard to figure out. You know, one thing that's great about having uh, 191 uh, podcast episodes and 700 YouTube videos is, uh, you know, what I think and what I say, it's out there. And it's in chronological order. Order, You can see it. I can't, uh, I can always take it back because I can always change my mind later and say I don't think that way anymore. But I can't stop the fact that I did think that way or said whatever I said in the past. Here's the reality. The very first guitar, you guys probably don't know this because it's just something you just don't see. But the very first guitar on this channel that was under like $300, $400, was a guitar sent to me by a viewer. His name was Ballant. And Ballant is a is a guy you've probably seen. He's he's done some stuff with other YouTube channels. He's sent out products to YouTubers as a as a viewer. He's has no company. Just just an average guy like us. He he buys some stuff and he just likes likes watching YouTube. So he sent out guitars. Um, that guitar was sent to me by Ballant. And here's why it was interesting. Ballant was the first one, and as far as I know, the only one that ever sent me an email saying, hey, Phil, I noticed you've never reviewed a cheap guitar on my channel. And there was a little bit of a, a secret there. I talked about them. I did a Squire versus Fender video. I did videos talking about cheap guitars, but I never reviewed any because I never bought any. Because at that point, I was only reviewing things that I, I bought and very few companies that were sending products out until this day still companies that send products out to youtube channels usually fall into two categories either they're having trouble selling the product so they want to get some excitement out there and send it out to some some social media channels because it's cheap right and it's effective so that helps too um or it's because it's new product and again it's effective cheap marketing because they can send it to you know somebody like us and we can just talk about it so usually things that are hard to sell are not inexpensive cheap guitars no one's ever going man how do i unload all these 145 dollars perfect les paul copies made by harley benton toman doesn't sit around worrying about how to get rid of inventory companies that make three thousand dollar guitars are trying to find the right customers because they're harder customers to find so that being said uh it was something I never had done until Balance sent that slick guitar. It was a slick guitar. Um, and it was eye-opening for me because uh, your reaction to it was really, really good. And at that point, I wasn't thinking. And I, and I actually talked to a, a YouTuber who has a car review channel. And he's got a similar story. He was out there finding exotic and new cars and talking about them, thinking, hey, everybody's got the, the Honda Civic. They wanted, they're dreaming about the, the Lamborghini and the Corvette. So I'm going to talk about those cars, you know, and he did the same thing. He, all of a sudden he reviews a, you know, a Datsun and everyone watches the video. I had the same experience. That slick guitar. I, uh, I don't think I have a single video. So think about this balance A viewer sent that guitar. It wasn't sent by slick. I don't, I didn't even talk to those guys. Um, and, uh, I think that video is about to hit a million views on a $200 guitar review. And so what was interesting was it was really my, me calibrating myself with the viewer going, okay, well maybe I don't understand the viewer the way I think I do. Right. Um, and, and that's why I sprinkle them now in. So I'll review, like, if you think about it in the last 60 days, I think, uh, give or take, please. I reviewed a $75 guitar and a $3,000 guitar. Those are both reviews I did on the channel. Um, but if you're paying attention, I bought the expensive one. That was the guitar I purchased with my own, you know, my, my money and did the video and the inexpensive one was sent to me by a company because it's not that I don't like any expensive guitars. Like I've said before, a million times over, I work on guitars all day. Most of the guitars I work on are inexpensive because most of the guitars that exist are inexpensive. So they don't really kind of excite me the way they used to, except for they're exciting in a video contents, uh, content context because it's fun to talk about something that shouldn't be good that is so it's an interesting question you pose um i don't personally think there's anything wrong with cheap guitars and talking about them i think that the bigger question i have and i guess what i want to say is there is an interesting thing i've seen and i'm always i i find interesting there's the guitar player who chooses to buy a cheap guitar which is different than a guitar player who has to choose the cheap, uh, cheap guitar. So what I mean by that is 
Um, my first guitar was uh, a cheap a JB player. My second guitar was a cheap Ario Pro. Uh, I mean, they weren't cheap to me. They were great guitars to me, but I'm, I mean, you know, I mean, one was 130 bucks and I think one was like a couple hundred bucks. I mean, these were, these were inexpensive guitars, especially in that. And you think now looking back, that was cheaper then, but it's actually, they're, they're less expensive now. <laughs> but anyways, my point is, um, it's, it's funny to me. I think some guitar players, I think just like anybody, they get to decide what is right for them. So I've met players that sure, they make the money. They, they have the money in the account. They don't have, they can walk into a music store right now and slap down that money for a PRS or a Sir. And they choose the three squires, two Epiphones and Ibanez as they have. They're totally content with that. I totally agree with that. And uh, so I don't really look at it that way. On the other aspect of the deforestation stuff, I don't know. You know what I mean? I'm not versed in this stuff. I'm just a guy who talks about guitars on the internet. What the hell do I know about that stuff? I watch everything like you guys do, uh, and I try to make the best decisions. I try to do the right things uh, uh, for my family, for the, you know, for the, the society I live in. I, I, I can only tell you that stuff. I wish I could tell you more. I have no idea. I can tell you, though, that I do believe that there are worse things that we can do than make guitars. <laughs> it's just just a thought. But I don't know. Like I said, let, let me know your guys' comments. Always like put comments in the, in the, in down below. I like when I'm skimming through them to see just different outputs of of ideas and process and how you guys process that same question and information. Um, let's see. Uh, the next one. Oh, let me go back to the where I, I screen grabbed them. And I appreciate you guys, by the way, coming in early and dropping questions. That was really cool. Um, let's see. The next one was... Oh, Grumpy Mike Guitar. This is an easy one, man. Grum Grumpy Mike Guitar asked me what I got for Christmas. My wife is going to kill me for this. <laughs> so, hold on. i got to reach behind my computer screen. All right. So, my kids sh shocked me last night. They gave me my Christmas gift last night. I... I had no idea it was coming at all. Just totally flabbergasted. And uh, I got to set this up. I am a, I'm going to say it, I'm a huge Bruce Campbell fan. If you don't know who that is, you're probably going to have to Google it. I'm sorry. Um, that's what I'm going to say. My, my wife will tell you that I'm a, fanatical pro, I'm a fanatical Bruce Campbell fan that probably has a man crush. No, she wouldn't say probably. <laughs> she tells me I have a man crush. To give you a concept of the Bruce Campbell love that i have uh he once mentioned that he uh wears this cologne called a uh, hove that's in a small shop in new orleans i tracked down the shop and got the cologne that he wears so that's what i wear so <laughs> i'm a fan that's what i'm trying to say so if you don't know who he is he was uh he's famous for obviously he was in uh uh evil dead evil dead one and two uh, army of darkness some of you guys know him if you know from burn notice um but he has a show you can see on Netflix. It's really not everyone's cup of tea. So please don't go run. Do your research. OK, this is not one of those things where I could say, like, you know, it's for everyone. It's not for everyone. In fact, you're going to see why in a second. So what did my kids do? They got me something I didn't even know really existed. If you guys are fans of Ash versus Evil, they got me the Ash versus Evil puppet. <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah if you guys know who he is it's uh, <laughs> so uh ash is a uh, a person with a I'm, I'm trying to get a screen i'm sorry i don't know how to do this okay uh with a chainsaw for a hand and in one of the uh shows he had a puppet and, and uh it was an evil puppet and they got me this is my first puppet so uh this was against my wife's recommendations. She didn't want them to get this for me. I, of course, loved it because it was so crazy and out there. I don't know what I'm going to do with a puppet now, <laughs> but I have it. It's cool. So that's what I got for Christmas, and it was actually the best Christmas gift I could ever, ever hope for because um, I, I didn't know. You know what I mean? When your kids come and bring you a gift, you're like, okay, what mug am I getting this year? You know what I mean? And that was really cool, and it's also... Uh, a sign that maybe I do have too big of a Bruce Campbell thing going on because my kids obviously knew that was the right gift. So there you go. Some of you guys won't get that. Some of you guys are probably loving it. Um, and like I said, if you decide to check out the shows and the movies, uh, do your research first because like I said, it's not for everybody. It's a little macabre and strange. And, and that's not what I really love, the movies. I actually like the, the person, the actor. I like watching him just speak at Comic-Cons and do Q&As and talk. 
So, um, okay, back to guitars. <laughs> okay, so, uh, all right. We are going to the next question. And again, I'm just doing the, these are all the pre-show uh, questions. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, okay, see, so, you know what? It's funny, I read the deforestation one, and then there it is right there. Okay, um, hold on. Oh, okay. So this one comes from Boots. He uh, Boots says thoughts on Eastman guitars and how much pressure uh, to to decent import companies put. Oh, okay. So okay. So it's a, it's like a two part question. So the first is thoughts on Eastman guitars, and um, which if you don't know, Eastman is a very very expensive high end made in China company. So the guitars are made in China, but they're very expensive and very nice. These are uh, fit and finished at the highest quality. They play great. You're never going to find anybody who picks up an Eastman and goes, ah, it was horrible. I mean, not never, but you don't understand. Um, and, uh, well, I've never come across a bad one. How about that? So anyways, uh, so that's what he's referencing is Eastman guitars, which are uh, high-end made in China. Uh, and it's not even made in Indonesia, Japan, stuff like that. They're pretty much made in China now. They might have been made somewhere before that, maybe Japan, but I don't know. I've always known them as made in China. Uh, so he wants to know, uh, on that, what do I think of them? Obviously I just said they're very good. Everyone I've worked on and touched has been a, a fantastic piece of instrument, you know, a, a nice instrument. Um, how much pressure do you think decent import companies put on American made guitars to lower their prices? If any, um, there is a lot of talk about that. You know what I mean? Uh, that's a question that's been coming up a lot lately. Obviously, like I said, I try to stay out of the politics, but I've, I've told you guys many times, this whole made in China, made in Indonesia, made in the USA, made in Germany, where the stuff's made is, is part of our our collecting culture. Is It's part of guitar buying and, and stuff. It's just part of it. So I try to dive into it enough to where we can get in it, keep it guitar related and get out of it. Um, that being said, I don't know how much effect it has on them to want to lower prices. And here's why I say that. Um, I think it's a logical thing to say that is there's quality instruments out there. Let's like take the Eastman, for example. You take a quality Eastman hollow body guitar and you can buy that guitar, which is pricey, but it's still a, a, a far shorter price to pay than a Gibson hollow body guitar. Does that put pressure on Gibson to lower their price? No, because I, I and this is why I believe this. Like I said, I've been to now 33 guitar factories. Okay. And that doesn't make me an expert by any means, but Hey, that's a lot of factories. In fact, I've noticed, like I've, I've said before to friends, I've been to so many factories now that I'm noticing that a lot of the factories haven't been to other factories because they don't know that, you know, they'll tell me something they have. It's unique. And I'm like, I've seen it 10 times already. But anyways, what I'm saying is, um, no, doing business in the United States has costs and those costs are heavy. And, uh, import uh, going to a lower a co lower cost regions uh, is is not going to be able to fix that problem. So what I mean by that is, uh, you could sit there and say all day that Gibson's overpriced, Paul Reed Smith overpriced, Sir's overpriced. You know, pick your brand. And um, I don't want to argue that because that's you know price is a in the eyes of the beholder, right? Um, what I want to argue is uh, the fact that it just costs a lot of money to build a guitar in the United States. It just does. It just does. And the proof in that is um, we see, you can see that if it wasn't the case, they would stay in the United States, but they're actually leaving in record numbers and they have been for the last 20, 30 years. Um, I like to point out I'm, I'm old, but I'm not that old. And I grew up uh, watching a Zenith TV with an RCA VCR, both of which were made in the USA. So, I mean, it's just the reality of things. People are going to go where stuff is cheaper to manufacture. So, uh, I don't, to answer the question, do I think it's putting a, a pressure on the U.S. manufacturers to lower prices? No, it's not putting pressure. It may slow it down because they have, they have, I think what I've seen is sometimes I've seen where a manufacturer in the U.S. is slotted to raise a price and then they back that off. Fender's a good example of that. Right, Fender, uh, Fender uh, uh, has, has continually tried to raise prices some, and and sometimes had to push it back and sometimes even reverse it. If you guys ever remember, I think in 2009, remember Fender raised all its prices 30 percent, right? It was 30 percent, 
and uh, might have been 20, <laughs> but it was still 20 to 30 percent. And uh, and they had to back that off because it was, you know, on the tail end of a recession or in the middle of it, depending on where you were in the country at that time. But uh, and um, I don't want to lose my train of thought. So back to the point of the point is uh, I think it pushes back the pricing. It doesn't it doesn't make them want to kind of be more competitive with it. The reality is, uh, as we've seen many times over, they charge what they can get. That's the reality of it. So when somebody says uh, Gibson Les Paul is not worth $2,500 new for a standard, uh, and I always say, well, if it's not worth it to anyone, it won't be. You know what I mean? It's just not worth it to you. It's it's the worst part of it. Somebody's willing to pay it out there, apparently. So, um, But the reality, too, is you got to understand. Uh, I'd have to. I'm looking at the screen so I can see the guitars behind me. Um, I could tell you right now, honestly, that I'm looking to see if I I paid. I've only paid, I'm, I'm looking right now. So in the guitars behind me, I've only paid uh, one guitar behind me that I see full price. And that was because of the pandemic and I wanted it. I won't tell you which one, but just let's say that's just the only one sticking out to me. The rest I got a deal on. You can get deals. That's the thing. You can get deals. So you can buy stuff used. You can find a dealer that wants to negotiate with you. Uh, you can find competitive pricing. Uh, again, I know this is a global audience, so some of you guys are not going to have the same experiences. But in the U.S., it's still pretty easy, except for kind of now a little tricky in the pandemic. But it's still pretty easy to go to a, uh, a retailer and get a deal. So, in fact, it's so easy. <laughs> it's so easy that uh, I think probably uh, there's 800 of you watching. I'm sure, again, half of you guys can probably attest to this. It's so easy to get a deal in the United States sometimes that sometimes you get a deal when you don't even ask for it. How many, uh, you know, how many of you out there have went to buy an instrument and then before you can actually purchase it, before you could tell them like, yeah, I'll take it. They're like, oh, we could knock 10% off or we'll throw in some stuff. I mean, the deal just comes and you're like, okay <laughs> but you're like i was gonna buy it anyways so i mean that happens we're competitive market uh let's uh let's hit some super chats i have some more of those penned from the beginning but um i don't want the super chats super chats to stack up let's call them super chats super chats okay Where's the first one? First one comes from David. David says, Merry Christmas, uh, Phil. Thank you, buddy. Uh, to, to those of us who celebrate Christmas, thank you. Uh, it says, I hope all is well with you. I'm looking to swap the gold uh, Paizo Bridge, Piazzo. I'm going to still do keep doing that. I'm going to always say Paizo. I don't know why. I just decided that's what I'm going to say, even though I know it's wrong. Uh, Paizo Bridge on my PRS Hollow Body 2 Core. Oh, you're going to swap your, okay, PRS Hollow Body 2 Core Bridge for a nickel one okay any idea where i might find one it is difficult job you have to get it from prs so if you have a prs hollow body 2 i have one too as well that's my prs hollow body 2 core behind me that i pointed at for the podcast listeners it's a blue one point i'm pointing at uh that is their system uh lr bags uh so you understand the the uh, the the pizza system <laughs> it's just an inside joke from a video i did uh the piezo system uh from prs is developed in in uh, uh in a cooperation with lr bags it's exclusive to their product it's their stuff um so i'm not saying it's 100 percent their stuff but it's it was it was designed with lr bags for that guitar so it is specifically that guitar you would have to get it from prs i would get it from prs and so that's who you would contact and uh, you just contact them uh, PRS is a small company. They look big, but they're small. They're like medium, I guess. You know, I mean, this, compared to the big guys. So uh, you call them. And there's only a couple, couple customers. Here. You'll probably get Sean or Matt, somebody like that, on the phone. Anyways, you call them up and you just tell them your issue, and, and hopefully they can square your way. Um, but there you go. That's what I would, I would do because it's their system. Uh, Life Blind uh, just did Merry Christmas. Oh, thank you, buddy um david says oh merry christmas back i should do that back if you say merry christmas i think that's i think that's the ethics on this by the way in my opinion uh if somebody says merry christmas to you you just say merry christmas back if somebody says happy hanukkah to me i say happy hanukkah back i just kind of like that's the thing um i've never really uh gotten upset that anyone didn't address or <laughs> right <laughs> uh i have a i have a friend who's an atheist and he i just tell him happy buying crap day because then you know it's, I think it's all just just goodwill. Just today's a day of goodwill. How about that? That'll still probably piss off somebody on the internet, but 
I'm just trying to have some fun, guys. Uh, David says, uh, hey, Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. That's another great way to say it, by the way. I don't want to get too into that today, but that's another way to say it. Say it, say it. Uh, to you and yours, hope all is well. Love your content. I trust your opinion. Thank you. I appreciate that. Just curious, what's your opinion on the Steinberger headless guitars? I want one. That's my opinion on that. Uh, and uh, my opinion is uh, that I want one and I don't want to pay $2,400 for an Indonesian made guitar. I'm just not ready there. I'm not ready. I'm not ready. It's totally a great guitar. <laughs> it's not the issue. It's just, it's, it's tough, right? And here's why it's tough. It has nothing to do with anything other than this. Imagine if you will, Okay. And I understand the Endura neck. I understand there's costs to the guitar that are different. I understand that. That being said, imagine, because it's true, imagine I could buy a Gibson Les Paul for $2,500 made in the USA. That's true. And then also I could buy a Brand X, because I don't have a brand, Brand X uh, Les Paul style guitar in the USA for $500. You'd be like, that's crazy. <laughs> Right. So you go to Gibson, you go, why is it two thousand dollars more? They can't go, well, because the manufacturing costs, because they're in the same country, same labor rates, same OSHA rules, same everything. So what's the big change in pricing? And that's how I feel about Strandberg. Uh it's great guitars, fantastic. Now I know please hold off if you're commenting right now that they make a twelve hundred dollar one. We're talking about the one I want is twenty four hundred dollars. So let's be clear about that. Um that being said, I have amazing Indonesian guitars that are $500 that are, in my opinion, as much as I just told you, I like the Strandberg, they're just as good. So it can be done. So I feel like the Strandbergs are a little priced out of where my comfort for that is. Um, so I have been looking at used ones. Uh, I've been looking, I'm waiting for the deal. That's what I'm doing. I'm waiting for the deal. Uh, cause here's what's great about this. Like I said, you don't need any of this crap, the stuff that we have. Okay. So, cause I don't need it. I'm going to wait till it's right for me. And what's right for me is finding the guitar I want for the price I want to pay. And I want to pay about 1500 bucks. That's what I want to pay. That's what I want to pay for a Strandberg. I feel like if I buy a Strandberg for $1,500, I feel like that'll be a fun guitar to have. It's a great experience. I'll be able to, see, I've played many of them because uh, as you guys seen in some videos, my uh, friend and uh, a guitar teacher, uh, Matt, uh, I think he has got he's got to have eight or nine of them. I don't know. He has so many uh, of them. And um, I so I played all his, and they're fantastic. I, Lawrence Petros has one. I played his. It's very good guitars. So, again, for me, I want to play $1,500. If, David, you love them and you're like, fine, then my opinion is you should get one and pay that price. I just don't want to pay that price uh, for it. And, of course, if I really wanted it, then I'd find a way to justify the price. But I'm not there yet, so I'll wait for the deal. Voodoo Fist says, uh, hey, Phil, Merry Christmas. Uh, thanks for another great year, uh, our shows and reviews. It was best part of 2020. Hey, that's great. Thank you. for <laughs> that's, that's a good thing to hear. Gives, gives me, gave me a little, uh, kind of little, little welling up in there a little bit for a second. Uh, it says, is there any gear coming in 2021 that you're excited for? So I, I, uh, I, uh, <laughs> let me let me put it this way. I, I, there is there is a few things, and when I say few, it's just because remember my interactions with companies are still very small. Um, I, I tend to, if you look at this year and my year in review, you can see um, most of the companies I worked with, I worked with them like two or three times. Okay, because uh, I find it's you guys that's interesting that to this equation. I have this really weird thing that happens to me, and I'm sorry I'm going on a tirade. Uh, uh, sideline voodoo fist but this is kind of it has to answer your question this way every time i do a video uh, is it, when about something that i'm excited about something i like you guys uh, as a whole the audience seems to really grab a hold and really back that product now not always sometimes you know sometimes you know some of you disagree and don't like the product but that's fine too but i'm just saying like if i if i talk about a product it usually comes over really well on the channel now the reason i'm telling you that is this Whenever that happens, I find that whatever company work with me wants to work with the channel again. Sometimes it's good because I'm very excited about the product and I want to do again. Sometimes it's not so good because that was the only product I found interesting of theirs. And when they're talking to me about more, it's tough, right? Because I'm like, I don't, you know, I got, I can't fake this like, hey guys, let's check out this guitar. It's a hard thing. Uh, you know, uh, in fact, in 2020, what you'll notice is if you look at my channel, there's, there's two or three times 
this year where for one full week I put out no content that week. It's because I just was emotionally not, I couldn't do it. I couldn't, hey guys, talk it up. I was just thinking how crappy everything was. <laughs> so now I can tell you that because it's hindsight and we're, 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 you know, we're getting through it. We're making through, through what all this ordeal we're getting through. But at that time, it was just a little too much for me to act like, hey guys, uh, isn't it cool to talk about guitars when really I wasn't, I didn't keep, you know, I wasn't in that mindset. So what I'm trying to tell you is, uh, is that although I've had success where when we do have products on the, co- on the channel, they do great and the companies want to deal with me. The majority of companies who've never dealt with me do not want to work with me at all. Uh, when I interact with them, it's usually just tons of comments of, of, of they don't know what I'm going to say. There's no control over, you know, I'm, 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 uh, they don't call me a smoking gun or anything like that. There's a term that I've heard a ton of times, and I've been to actually talked to other YouTubers who said they heard the same thing discussed about me, which is funny. Uh, it unpredictable. I'm unpredictable. They don't know what I'm going to say about their products. So a lot of companies still think that uh, YouTube gear channels are marketing outlets, and it's not true. This is entertainment outlet. You guys are watching this because we talk. This is what you like to talk about guitars, like me. We're talking about guitars, and by getting their brands on these channels, it becomes part of our discussions, and it puts it in your, you know, in your, in your crosshairs, and it's something you can consider. Um, but a lot of companies still think that uh, if you know this is just YouTube was created and gear channels were created so that they can be like, you know the greatest product ever. Check this out. You know, and it's just not that we're not there yet. So, uh, that way, (laughs) that way. So that's my long way of saying, um, I have one company, (laughs) one company has sent me an email about next year's products. Um, and, uh, and, uh, the only thing I can tell you that's good is, uh, uh, that video will be out, uh, by January 15th. So that's a pretty cool, exciting product, but otherwise I haven't heard anything. I don't get any, any, any uh any interaction so that's why i said if you guys see me talking about like boss pedals fender guitar stuff like that's the stuff i'm still just buying and talking about on the channel so all right that was my long way to tell you i just don't have any idea should have just said that would have been faster save you guys a lot of time vapor trails says i just got an ibanez genesis rg 550 dx your thoughts on that on that guitar and how do you get the most out of it mods pickups and uh, I seem to have gotten one of the last ones. Have they been discontinued? Thanks. Merry Christmas. Um, I haven't heard officially that they've been discontinued. However, I would not be shocked because uh, I'm shocked that they've been around this long. I think they came out in 2017. Does that sound right? Like they've been producing those guitars for a while. Um, and me, what I think personally, have been just sacking the value of those things to holy crap. crap. So... If you guys aren't familiar with what I'm talking about, uh, Ibanez reissues the RG550 as a, uh, you know, they did it in uh, 2008. I think they did in 2008. They did the uh, Desert Yellow and the Road Flare Red. There was black. And um, they did those three. $1,000 back, back in 2008, street price. Case, made in Japan. And that was an anniversary thing. And then later, I think 2017, they reissued them again. And this time they added the purple. So it was like black, purple, uh, uh, road flare red, you know, and then they added the other two that have the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, rosewood fretboards and stuff. Anyways. Uh, so they're about a thousand bucks made in Japan. I don't think they come with cases now. I'm, I could be wrong. Um, I'm sorry, vapor trails. I just don't remember, but, uh, they've been making them for a while. So what I've noticed is you can pick them up for cheap. There was a time when all of them used were at least a thousand dollars and now you can find them for 600 bucks all day long. Um, it, you know, so, uh, I haven't heard the discontinued, but I, I wouldn't be shocked at all. Cause like I said, it's been a long run for something like that. And I think it's, I think they've produced, um, I won't say too many, but they produce a lot. So it's going to take a while for the market to adjust. How many people are really looking for the 1987 Ivan is RG 550. I mean, there's a lot of guys like me that are into those guitars, but not a whole lot of guys. <laughs> so our gar- girls, by that matter, um, quality wise, I mean, they're made in Japan, ja- uh, J- uh, Japanese made uh, Ibanez's, and at a thousand bucks, I like them. So I like them. So I have one. I don't have the Genesis. I have the 2008 version. I really like it. In fact, if you guys caught, maybe I talked about this on the show. I can't remember. I bought an original 87 RG 550. And uh, I bought that, and I, I think I showed it on my Instagram, and I maybe talked about it briefly on the podcast. 
Um, I might do a video with that. But since then, it's uh, an 87. It's beautiful. It's got the original case, original uh, uh, catalog, all the stuff that's with it. It's beautiful. I don't like it as much as my reissue, which shocks me to no end. I bought it because I was like, I, I thought in my head, I kept remembering the originals being slightly better than the reissues. It's not that it's not better. It's just, it's not, it's, I don't know. I, maybe I bonded to the reissue. I like the reissue better. It's an untangible thing. I can't really put anything on it other than, uh, you know, then I like the neck of the, the feel of the neck on the uh, Genesis. However, your other party question was what pickups did you, I just put new pickups in my RG 550. That video will be out soon. Um, I put the fortitude in the neck, the DiMaggio fortitude in the neck, and I put the tone zone in the bridge and I, and I removed the middle pickup. So that's what I did. Uh, and I'll explain in that video why, but that's the pickup combination that I really liked in the RG 550 based on a bunch of stuff. Uh, I actually had these nice conversations. I was lucky enough to have nice conversations with Larry DiMaggio. And from those conversations, I was able to figure out that's, that's the pickup combo I wanted. So there you go. Uh, let me go back to the, I know I got some super chats, but let me go back to the non super chats. So I can see what you guys are talking about. And again, if you're talking to me, put a question mark first. Um, Terry's got a question. Terry says Orville. Orville Greco, Takai, Edwards, or Made in Japan Epiphone. Looking to get a great quality Les Paul custom, but not pay 5K. Um, I like, in, in those guitars you mentioned, I like the Edwards the most. Um, I just do. Uh, I don't know why. I can't, again, you know, this is all just, you know, hey, this is the things I've touched and these are the memories I have. Touching those guitars, I like the Edwards the most. Um, the Made in Japan Epiphone is really good. I don't feel like they were ever any better than they, the Korean ones. Uh, you know what I mean? I mean, it's not like a, they weren't good or they weren't bad. It's just um, the Epiphone Korean ones, to me, still feel really, really good when I pick them up. And Greco, the Orville, I think... So in order, I'm going to say Edwards. Then I might go the Made in Japan uh, Epiphone then the Orville, and that's really tough because that's about tied for me because I really, every Orville I picked up was great. Greco and Takai are really cool guitars because I like them, but I have played bad ones and good ones from both those brands. But keep in mind, the biggest problem with those two brands for me is the majority of the guitars I've touched, which is about you know four or five of each, I've been used and have been used. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? So sometimes when you pick up a guitar, like I I picked up a Greco and it maybe when it was new, it was good. But, you know, now that it has, you know, f worn frets and all the stuff, I mean, that's what's a problem with some of those guitars. They just get really played to death. Um, the thing about guitars like that, this is a, always an interesting uh, sidebar kind of thought when you think about affordable, good quality, affordable guitars, is that, when guitars like those brands are known for being such good quality at a better price than their higher end counterparts, I find that players buy them. So when you get them used, they have been played, <laughs> right? You very rarely come across an Edwards, an Orville Greco or Takai or an Epiphone that's, you know, 20 years old. And it's like, oh, it's case classic. It's just been in a case the whole time. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's not the case. It's like, this has been played in about 700 bars. <laughs> So, so that's the problem with some of those guitars for me is that I, most of my experience for stuff like that is, you know, working on it, repairing it, trying to fix it. And so, uh, those get played the most and you see that a lot. In fact, more so than any other brands. Like I don't see a whole lot of squires that come in for repair from being played to death. You know what I mean? Uh, I, I see a lot of people playing them, but that doesn't see that, you know, usually see a lot of like, uh, like I said, you'll see Greco, Takai, I'm trying to think of the other brands you see a lot. You'll see a lot of like, Kramers, old Kramers. Um, there's just a lot of guitars that you see that players have been like literally just playing them. Okay. Oh, Don says, would I post a, please post a mailing address for cards and letters. Yeah, I can do that. Um, 
that's something I will fix. I used to just cheat because I had a website. I had the know, I, the net website, and it was basically just information drop. And then I would link that to all the videos. But at some point, it just didn't make sense because I was just sending you guys to a place that nobody's interested in going anymore. So I'll have to figure out how to just put it out there. My address uh, is not private. Not, not not the address you guys see. It's a business address, so I'll put it out there. It's It used to just be public all the time, but I will make sure that gets done. Um, and Don, I will give an update next week on how I did it. <laughs> what I did. I, I don't think I can impregnate it all 700 videos, but I, I got to figure out what it... Oh, you know what I'll do? I'll make sure it's updated on the Facebook page. And if Instagram allows me to do that, maybe I'll do that. I don't know. If you guys have suggestions on how to do that, let me know. Um, okay. Okay. Station station Bill and Ted thing. Okay. Station unrest said, <laughs> uh, do you get approached by non guitar related companies to uh, review products? Yeah, I do. Uh, cause I'm in the quarter million sub category. You gotta understand these companies, um, not only do they have agencies, but then there's just, there's, uh, there's just companies that do this too. There's lists out there. I don't know how they get them, but it's obviously, it's obvious that they, they can go to uh, these social blade companies and all these other companies and get information about YouTubers and not even about their subscriber counts. You can find out what YouTubers are trending. Cause sometimes I'm trending and sometimes I'm not, you know what I mean? That just happens, right? You know, I do a couple, you know, clickbaity cool videos and then all of a sudden it's like oh the channel's growing and it's and they and i get on somebody's radar i always notice that like as soon as i hit a couple you know home runners out of on the videos like the the, the vegematic companies start coming out of the woodwork and it's always the same guys it's always like skillshare skillshares uh, approached me um uh, at least a half a dozen times offered uh and they always offer i think they offer me 500 bucks for 60 seconds to 90 second spot in the beginning of a video um i won't i say i won't i won't do it uh i don't know why i trust me it's those things that you you know i, I hope i don't end up regretting all that crap later um the i thought about that stuff the the problem is is uh, with Skillshare, nothing wrong with the company, by the way. I mean, that I know of. I didn't do any research about them, but I'm not saying I don't have a personal grievance with them. Um, but it was some kind of script. I, I can't do it. I can't read a script. I'm just horribly inept. Remember, I'm not a, I'm not, this isn't like a gig. You know what I mean? Like, look, you have to understand, it's not like a gig, like I want to be a rock star. And then one day I'm playing in front of audiences on stages. Okay. That's not how YouTube works for me. Okay. I threw some videos out on YouTube and the next thing I know, I hit a, I hit a, a video that, that was the five things you don't know about the strat that hit a home run and like million and a half, two million views, like nothing. And then, and then the channel just started growing. And then as it grew, I was like, oh, this is kind of fun doing this. And I kind of discovered this as a fun thing to do. Uh, talking to you guys, like the Friday show, this is a total accident. You guys were just sending so many emails every week. I thought, well, how am I going to answer all this crap? So I went on a live thing. I hit the live thing. I think the first live show is still up. It's a train wreck. It's me and Ralph trying to figure out my cell phone, how to get to stream. Um, and so everything was just this, you know what I mean? And then, you know, and then the first time a company sent a product, it was like, oh, cool. Well, I want to share this with you guys. This is cool. Why, why would a company send a product? I was thinking, like, I, I feel actually it was probably the biggest compliment I ever got. Like, oh, I must be doing something good. And I didn't realize they just sent them to everybody that has a channel. <laughs> so, but still, there's nothing wrong with that either. I mean, at least, you know, it's, it means you're, you're doing something that's engaging people. Um, that being said, I just don't know if I'm ready to do like the video game apps or uh, the skill shares or <laughs> what's the other ones. You get tons of Amazon crap, man. Everybody who sells crap on Amazon wants you to promote their thing, whatever that is. They don't care. And they don't care. They don't care what your channel is. Like, here's a spatula. And, <laughs> and so uh, so you get, you get solicited with that stuff all the time. Uh, I mostly just block that stuff out. It's just not something I'm interested in because I'm not good at it. It's not something I want to spend time at. I'm still I'm still trying to master editing, making content. You know what I mean? There's so much stuff I have to work on as a whole. <laughs> how about how about just pronouncing and speaking correctly? Again, things that I didn't I didn't spend my life trying to make this this gig happen. So I once it happened, I had to figure it out fast. And I and it doesn't feel like I'll probably see some of you guys like it's fast, but it it is. It is fast. 
Uh, I finally, I was talking to, I think I t- <laughs> talked to my patrons about this. Uh, in 2017, October, this is to give you a reference point. In 2017, October of 2017, I went to the na- the first GitCon, uh, which was uh, which was the Henning Poly set up to GitCon in Germany. And at that time, I had a hair on my microphone. <laughs> uh, so obviously it wasn't mine. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyways, uh, so uh, uh, anyways, I went to the GitCon thing, and the the thing that's probably interesting to know is that uh, at that time I didn't own or use any cameras or computers. So I went to GitCon 2017 with a hundred thousand subscribers on the channel, you guys, because you're awesome, and I was still making all my videos on my phone. A hundred percent. I had a. I had a. I had an interface that went into my phone. That's how I was plugging in mics, micing up my amp, little pull up mic towards me. But it was all into my Galaxy. I think it was a Galaxy Seven. I don't know. It could be in Galaxy Six phone. That's how all the videos were made up that day. <laughs> and then what happened was when I went to the GitCon, I was like, oh. I'm like a real YouTuber, I think. <laughs> so I went down and I bought a MacBook, which is why I use Mac this day because I have no idea. You, some of you guys, I hope, find this interesting because uh, I know everybody gives me, I'm gonna, I won't curse, not on Christmas. But anyways, uh, they're not, they don't give me crap. They, people give me crap. Uh, so I went and bought a MacBook Pro and a camera. And I thought, oh, okay, I'll learn how to use a computer and a camera. So at that point, I had to learn editing software, how the camera works, all that stuff. Up until then, I was editing everything on my phone with an app that I still use to this day that costs two dollars and ninety nine cents. So, uh, uh, what was I gonna say? Uh, the uh, the point of this is uh, that's why I don't entertain the other stuff. It just doesn't. It doesn't. I don't know how to do it yet. I don't think it's gonna be anything I'm gonna uh, adapt to. Um. Uh, Arthur, Arthur Jet. Sorry, well, we got off guitar stuff, but today's kind of a bonus podcast. It's Christmas Day. I figured we just goof off today. I hope you guys are with me on that. Um, Arthur had a great question because it was really cool. He said, "Does hand sanitizer affect neck finish?" Look, this is a a, a story uh, that I hope. Uh, oh, crap. You know what? I gotta keep it. I gotta keep it. Just please bear with me. It's like I gotta keep the names to protect the innocent. I didn't get a clearance to tell you this, so I'll tell you the story, but not who told me. Okay, uh, just understand somebody I trust in, uh, immensely. Uh, somebody had told me that during COVID, when working at the guitar factory that they worked at, that there was an issue with when the employees came back, they were using hand sanitizers and it was affecting the finishes and they had to do a lot of redoing of finishes on guitars. So I don't know if it affects the finishes once it's been cured and it's out to the public, but they were definitely having a problem with it and it was slowing down production they had to, and they had to work around it. It was one of the, the, the obstacles that that company had to overcome when they went back to work. So uh, the reason I tell you that is I don't know if it does, but obviously that happened, so you should be aware of it. So uh, I wouldn't... If it was me, I wouldn't touch my guitars that you care about with hand sanitizer on my hands. My guess is, this is my guess, hand sanitizer is probably mostly just alcohol and probably some kind of gelatin or something to thicken it. Again, I'm I'm not, I have no idea what I'm talking about when it comes to hand sanitizer. I don't work in that industry. But either way, I wouldn't put it on my guitars. I just wash my hands. You know what I mean? Just wash your hands. I wash my hands a lot now anyways because I think the hand sanitizer um, is just going to eventually dry out your hands and, and cause problems anyway. So every time I use hand hand sanitizer, as soon as I get home, um, I'm very lucky. Uh, my uh, We have a sink in my garage. So when we come home, the first thing we do is we wash our hands before we go in the house. So I wash my hands before touching the guitars. It has, and that's actually not new. It has nothing to do with COVID. I've been washing my hands before I touch my guitars forever. Uh Beavis says it's mostly alcohol. Yeah, and it will re- wreak havoc on lacquer. I yeah, I I would imagine so. I, like I said, it's I don't think it's a it's it's. How about this? Uh, 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 to the person that asked that question, I wouldn't want to be the guinea pig for that. So don't do it. <laughs> right? Wait for those other. Wait for wait for the gear page in Reddit to start those streams where somebody's like, my finish is ruined, and you can see their pictures of their ruined guitars. Don't be the person that has to put those pictures up. Be the person that waited. Just wash your hands, soap and water. It's easy enough. So it's better for everything. It's better for your guitar to wash your hands before you play guitar, anyways, because the oils in your skin get in the strings and kill the. They dead in the strings, anyways. That's why I do it. Because I like bright strings. And if you like bright strings, uh, you either go broke, changing strings all the time, or you figure out how to keep your strings as bright and as clean as long as possible. So 
that's what I do. I wash my hands before I play guitar. And I wipe down the strings when I'm done. I always dry cloth wipe my guitars down. Uh, hmm. Uh, Abby says, I use denatured alcohol to remove polyfinish. Sure, I use denatured alcohol too to remove all kinds of stuff. So I have no doubt about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've used denatured alcohol just to remove uh, print on things. You know what I mean? Like prints on amps, prints on guitars and stuff. You know, printed like silkscreen printed, you know, uh, paint or ink stuff. So yeah, of course. Um. Let's see. Uh, hold, hold on. <laughs> this one's great. Uh, these something. I don't know what this is. These the oh the Seth the Seth and Byers. I guess I don't know. There's no commas. It says I eat while playing. I eat while playing sometimes. Yeah, that don't. <laughs> I wouldn't. You know, you can eat fried chicken. Maybe it makes you play faster. I'll tell you what. Let us know if that works. If you eat fried chicken, do you play faster? <laughs> Creasy hands sl slide across those strings. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. Let's go. Let's get a super chat. couple super chat questions going again. Um, hold on a second. We have... Uh, Sarang, Sarang says, happy holidays, Phil. Do you check out, uh, Vertex's new video on the Nux Steel Singer being a clone of his steel string? Okay. I personally feel that ideas cannot be, uh, privatized. Ideas are inherently meant to be shared and products are just material manifestations on, of ideas. You know, there's a fantastic video that I just watched of Josh Scott from JHS Pedals and it was some random QA thing. And I don't even know if it was on his channel and I'm pretty sure it was, I found it through Sweetwater. Like I was, I bought some new uh, studio monitors from Sweetwater uh, just like two weeks ago, a week ago. And I don't know what I was doing, but I was, you know, doing the, you know, researching the, the monitors and stuff. And then I ended up watching this video with Josh Scott. So the point of it was he was talking exactly about this, about that some of his stuff he makes is clones of other people's and some of the stuff they make is clones of his. And, and he said he doesn't really bo bother him. The, the thing about this is, there's two arguments and we've had this so many times in this channel and so many iterations from guitars to amps to pedals. And it's always going to be the thing. Um, and here's, here's, here's what I want to say. Okay. I, I, I view myself as a creator on, on the YouTube platform. Okay. I create content. Um, and some people are going to look at it as like, you just, you know, you're, you're just doing reviews or you're doing whatever, but either way it's creating content. It takes time to come up with the idea and sometimes people take your ideas that happens all the time so i can i can relate to that to somebody going okay i, I, I spent a lot of work doing this and now somebody's just copying it now they see me do it however that being said i also really agree with if you're not innovating you're going to be dying anyways so it's a tough it's a tough thing it's a tough question um my personal opinion about it is is that i really feel like is trademarks are the most important thing. Okay. The, because trademarks are the part where I feel like, and again, this is just opinion. I know I keep saying that because you know, Hey, it's the internet. <laughs> I got to anticipate the 15 negative comments. I got to contend with later. Uh, my opinion is as long as you're not infringing on trademarks, you're not trying to deceive customers. Okay. Deceiving people is what pisses me off. Okay. So for instance, Harley Benton copies of Gibson Les Paul. I don't care. I wish I did. I'm, I wish I did. I wish I could come to some conclusion where I care that Harley Benton copied Gibson or Fender. I just don't care. A PRS. I don't care. Because you know why? Because I don't think there's a moron out there walking around going, I don't know. I think I want a PRS and a Harley Benton must be one because of the same shape. I go on the road. Think about this. My wife drives a Honda Accord. She had to put a special thing on her car because half the time she goes in the park lot, parking lot, she can't find her car. Why? Because every car looks like a silver Honda Accord and a Honda Accord looks like every silver car, right? Trucks look the same now. Things get generic. I'm not saying that's right. I'm just saying it's the world we live in. We got to be we got to be aware of it. So what I'm saying is, is if a company copies something like that, I'm not saying it's right. I'm saying I don't care. 
It's not something that registers in me that says, okay, that's wrong. Here's what bugs me though. It's when somebody purposely tries to deceive a customer into something. And, and like, for instance, like, if Harley Benton copies Gibson, I don't care. But when Chipson's are out there, but they say Gibson on them, like somebody makes a fake Gibson and puts Gibson on it, that pisses me off. Here's why. Because it's not because I care about Gibson or any company for that matter. <laughs> they're companies. They got, you know, they're, they're big boys. They can handle themselves. Or big girls. They can handle themselves. That's purposeful to deceive the customer. And that's what I don't like. I don't like the idea that somebody pays for something they think is one thing, but they get another. That does not right. The reality is this. Somebody who wants a real PRS, a real Gibson, and a real Fender will buy it. And the person who just wants that functionality of that guitar or the look of the guitar, but doesn't want to pay what that company charges, they'll buy their Harley Benton. Both customers I perceive in, is to be happy and fulfilled with the purchases they made. The same thing with this. If New X or Moore or Joyo or <laughs> whoever, Joyo or whoever else wants to copy a pedal, well, then I would imagine that if you like the, uh, the Vertex stuff, because um, it's very good sounding stuff, then you'll buy from them, I think. That's my opinion about that, which is very interesting because I've heard you, uh, you guys have heard me say many times, my wife does not like Behringer products because they clone everything. She does not have the same opinion about things as me. She, she really thinks copying things is wrong. Stealing is wrong. In fact, so you know, because I might as well throw a can of worms in today's bonus show, my wife cannot stand Kemper. So you know, she, she, her and Henning Polly would get along perfectly. My wife thinks that Kemper is flat out theft. That's what my wife thinks. It's weird that she has an opinion about that because like I've told you, she really doesn't care about this industry, but it's not that she cares about guitar tones. She thinks that it's horrible for a company to basically steal everybody else's sound and then you know, sell it to you. <laughs> so I, I guess I don't have that opinion. So it makes interesting co discussions. When we have that. So it's, this is always a great subject. I hope this guy gets you guys talking because I don't think there's ever a right answer to these. Okay. I think this is just, it's important that we discuss these things. So I think that it's always interesting, but I really, I'll try and find that uh, Josh, Gosh, uh, Josh Scott QA because I thought his take on it was really interesting. He was basically saying, well, I'm actually kind of stealing from him a little bit. <laughs> Speaking of stealing stuff, uh, he was basically saying sometimes it matters and sometimes it do doesn't. I'm pretty sure that's a quote from him, by the way. And I felt the same way. Sometimes it bugs me. Sometimes it don't. It depends on what they're doing. I think New X trying to make an affordable version of somebody's high-end stuff. Sure, of course. Did they copy it and clone it out? Yeah. And 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 Vertex also took a Chinese wah pedal and repackaged it as American made. Not everybody's perfect out there, guys. We all make mistakes. <laughs> it happens uh so uh you know and, and if it's and if it's a legal issue here's the good news we don't have to argue that uh the legal issue will resolve it so if they have a legal case that'll be different uh let's see uh thomas i'm gonna try to read some of you guys comments because i think you guys this stuff gets everybody going a little bit in a good way hopefully thomas says if copying was wrong only a few european countries would li live a modern life. You know, exactly. It's exactly like we, I think we all agree that taking something and making it better is always good for society. It's good. Okay. So, you know, you take, take an existing product, you make it better. Hey, I invented the car. And the next guy goes, I invented a seatbelt. That's better. <laughs> okay. Right. Okay. So, so there's that logic. In the modern world, we did hit a point where it's not about improving anymore. It becomes about cloning. Cloning becomes a part of our, of our, our, uh, our fiber of our society. It's like, hey, I, you know, <laughs> here's a good example. Uh, we all have big screen TVs. I, I know it's kind of loosely saying we all, but I mean, come on. It, here's why I think we all have big screen TVs. Uh, you can't get rid of an old TV now anymore. Like you used to try to give them away and they don't even want them anymore because big screen TVs are so cheap. Um, so what I'm saying is it used to be when we were younger, for those of us older guys, uh, Hugh Hefner had a big screen TV. That, that, that was like a huge, that was like a rich dude thing to have a giant projection TV in their mansion. And we, you know what I mean? So I would, I would bet, cause I'm not in the TV industry that if we go over there and talk to them, to the, to the people that are experts in that industry, they'll tell us flat out that that's what happened right? A couple of people innovated big TVs and then that made big TVs, but then people start copying that and making it more affordable. So making stuff affordable is going to be ingrained in the fiber of our society for a long time. It's why 
It's why we get to have a channel like this where we talk about guitars and it's why I can stand for two hours in the parking lot because I've done it in the last week talking to a total stranger that just happened to see my show once about how much he loves his $200 guitar and how much I love my $1,500 guitar. And we were having a great conversation and at no point did I go, oh, you have a two hundred dollar guitar; those are crap. And nor did he go, "Oh, you overspent." Right? We we understand what was good about each product. We like them. We had our opinions. We went on. Um. Let's see. Uh, Harmonicaster. Hey guys, Harmonicaster says, "Hey, uh, you can't patent or trademark a sound." Harley Davidson tried to trademark the exhaust sound with the V10 and got shut down. Um. This is this is correct. And again, now you're talking about the legality. We're talking about, that's what I said. You're going to have to talk about that. And then you're going to talk about the morality. The Kemper system, like I said, I obviously, it's hard for me to to talk because I don't really, I don't really disagree with your statement. <laughs> right. That's how I feel. Um, I don't disagree at all. Like I said, my, my wife and I have had the same conversation. Uh, she's on the... I, she doesn't think the Kemper system's right. And I'm on the, I don't, I'm not that, by the way, I'm not saying I think the Kemper system's right. I'm saying I don't care. It's a thing I don't care about. I feel like if I want a Friedman amp, I will buy a Friedman amp. <laughs> if I don't want a Friedman amp, but I want a, a sound that sounds like a Friedman, I guess I'll buy the Kemper. To me, it's, it's, it's very confusing for me personally, because I filter like all of you, I filter everything through my own logic. And my logic says when I, when I want a, an, a real tube amp, I want a real tube amp. I don't want a synthetic amp. So you're not going to convince me, not that a synthetic amp isn't good. I think they're amazing. You're not going to convince me when I want that to go the other way. Does it make sense? So that, like I said, I think they're different products. Even though they can claim they sound the same, they're different. Okay. Uh, let's see. Hold on. <laughs> I'm trying to siphon through comments. Um, oh, now I'm just quiet. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna grab a super chat while I so I can while you guys comment. When you guys comment a lot, sometimes it's hard for me to see the questions again because it just gets a lot of stuff streaming through. Okay, so we have BK. BK says, Happy holidays to you, Phil, to your family and all the KYG community. Thank you, BK. I appreciate that. This is a good time to segue into the update that I told you guys I would do for you. So last Saturday, I did have the Hot Ones Challenge. For those of you that know what the Hot Ones is, it's a show on YouTube where they have celebrities on and they eat 10 stupid hot spicy sauces on wings. I, of course, uh, was uh, dumb enough to buy that pack of sauces. My, my kids and I are arguing now. I said on the show for sure that they talked me into this. They're saying I talked them into this. I think they're trying some Jedi crap on me. Anyways, what happened? My buddy Eric myself, my son, and my daughter all did the hot one challenge. What ended up happening was if I, uh, is that my daughter won. Eric was definitely the close tie contender because he he did it really good. It's just my daughter's apparently more competitive. We thought she was competitive by nature. She's a little more competitive than we thought. <laughs> um, some of the patrons know because I, I did film it. I talked about filming it. I will release uh, some pictures and stuff and, and stuff, but we did film it. I, I post on the patron page uh, just to let some of the patrons see some of the shenanigans of it. It was it was quite a fun experience. By fun, I mean I will never do that crap again. I had no problem the next morning. That was because the uh, the my, Eric and his amazing wife, Stephanie, or Stephanie and her amazing husband, Eric. I don't know how I should put that. Uh, oh, and I got my hot one uh, thing, by the way. So they were amazing enough. They, they got Pepto-Bismol, and we did a shot. So do, do this, by the way. This is what I'm going to tell you. They gave us a shot of Pepto-Bismol, like a shot glass. So at the end, we all drank a shot of Pepto-Bismol. Let me tell you, as soon as I... We all agree, all four of us. As soon as we took the shot, whatever was killing us was done. And I had no problems the next morning and neither did, I think, anybody else. And I got a sticker that says, I did it. <laughs> so I did it. If you guys are thinking about doing it, um, here's what I will tell you because it's expensive. It was like 120 bucks for all those sauces. 
It's not worth it. I mean, I don't know. I, I mean, I bought it, but I'm hindsight. Uh, they don't really get hot until uh, uh, the Scorpion. That gets a little warm. Other than that, they're not really hot up until that point. So here's what I would recommend if you're trying to save some money. Uh, the bomb is horrible. It, it tastes like uh, burnt rubber and it burns like hell. Um, and uh, and the last dab is also tastes horrible and it burns like hell. So if you want to experience the crappy part of this, just buy those two sauces. You'll be miserable. And you'll never want to do this again. That's my high, that's my input. I'm sorry. I, th I told you guys I'd give you an update. So there you go. Hold on, I'm gonna go to the comments. Anybody saying anything? I uh, uh oh, my my knees hurt. Says I'm a hot sauce addict. Uh, I make my own mostly though. Yeah, well, it's like I said, most of these were uh, some of these were good, but most of them were not so good. It was um, woo. Uh, Fret level midnight says Pepto has a a small amount of arsenic. Look, I don't care what's in Pepto. <laughs> <laughs> they could have told me it was Care Bear crap. <laughs> I wouldn't have cared. <laughs> that I was I was miserable. I handled this not very well. Uh, it, uh, so you know the whole challenge. I basically um, I got through it. I ate everything I was supposed to do, but man, it was it was not a. a it's a funny thing in hindsight now. <laughs> It's like, a, oh, I did it. That was fun. And in another month or two, when you ask me, I'll probably tell you how funny and great it was. But at the moment, I just remember thinking, this is dumb to do this to yourself on purpose. Uh, so Sarang wants to know, Jedi crap minds me, reminds me, he reminds him, Jedi crap. Do I watch The Mandalorian? Oh, yeah, hell yeah, I do. I did. It's over now. And it was great. If you guys don't watch that, watch that show. If you would have told me when I was a kid that there was going to be a show with basically Boba Fett and Yoda. I know it's not Yoda. You understand. I know it's not really Boba Fett and partially either. But if Boba Fett and Yoda flying through the galaxy, I would have laughed at the stupidest idea on the planet. Yet, I think it's the coolest Star Wars thing I've ever seen. Funny thing. <laughs> so, I don't know. It's a, that show is fun because it's a, it's a, it, people love it or hate it. I loved it. I had a blast. Okay. Uh, Martin Leahy. He wants to talk about guitar stuff, I'm sure. Martin says, I have just purchased a Fender Acoustic um, reverb pedal. Okay. And uh, do I put it in my electric pedal chain or separate chain all into itself? Uh, well, if you're going to run your acoustic through it, I wouldn't put it in your, your electric guitar chain because you're not going to... I mean, miss, unless I'm misunderstanding the question, I hope I'm not. Uh, if it's for your acoustic guitar, I would run it separate to whatever source you're running the acoustic to. If it's you're going to run it for your electric guitar as a reverb, put in your chain what you want to put it towards the end. I put um, I put delay always last, just my preference, and reverb before delay. Some people will fl flip that always, but if I'm using reverb and delay, I always put reverb then delay. That's just and they're always last in my chain, except for the exception of a looper, of course. If I have a looping pedal, that's always last in the chain. Sometimes off the board, you know what I mean, and just out out to the side. George did a super chat, and so did Andy for no reason. F thank you, guys. I appreciate that uh, uh, very, very much. Uh, Jeff, just Merry Christmas. Thank you, guys, so much for doing this. Hope you guys are having a great day today. I'm actually having fun today, too. Um, we, me, I uh, had breakfast with the wife this morning. The kids, my kids are older. They they don't they don't care about this stuff anymore. <laughs> so, um, and uh, hold on. Let's get back to... I'm missing stuff. How am I missing it? Okay, so uh, Jeff, thank you again. Uh, Mr. Fancy Hands. That's a great name, right? Especially for a guitar channel thing, Mr. Fancy Hands. Happy Holidays. Uh, it says, when people say studio quality guitar, what is the most budget studio quality guitar? Do Made in Mexico Fenders, PRS, SEs have studio pickups? So I, I'll have a different perspective on this, okay? So studio for me... Uh, is an interesting thing. I, I, there's an etiquette to getting your guitar set up or worked on and the idea that when somebody brings me a guitar to work on, they will generally, t genuinely, t generally, not genuinely, generally tell me what their intent is. So let me give you an example. Some guys bring in a guitar and they say, hey, I just need to set up. Okay, fine. 
And some people are like uh, come in and tell you it's bad and they need it, you know, fixed. You're right. That's fine. But sometimes they'll say, I'm going in the studio. That's like a normal thing, by the way. I'm going in the studio, blah, 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 like next Thursday or next Friday or in two days. And I need this guitar set up for the studio. So it's very normal to tell a tech that you need the guitar set up for the studio because in the studio, everything matters. So you're really focused on the sound. So sometimes people will say, I'm playing. So when somebody says, uh, comes to me and says, I'm, I need the guitar set up and I'm playing out tomorrow. What they're usually talking about is tuning stability. So I got to make sure that when I do the guitar setup, I take extra time, not only to stretch the strings, which I normally do anyways, but really kind of wrench on the guitar because they're basically telling you they want the guitar to play really good, but they need it to play so it stays in tune. When somebody says they want it set up for studio, they usually want the intonation focused on. OK, and you do all these things when you do a setup, but sometimes you want to spend extra time in certain things. Intonation is definitely the part of it. The other thing you're going to pay attention to is the pickups, uh, uh, the height. You know, make sure that they're exactly in a sweet spot. You also want to make sure that the action is not super low so that it because if it gets super low, it gets a little buzzy. So usually when you're in the studio, you don't focus on how easy the guitar play is to play. You focus on how good it sounds. So I know that's not what you're asking, but I just need you to know, understand that. Now to your part where you're saying budget studio quality guitars made Mexico Fenders SEs are they studio pickups? Studio is is has nothing to do with that. <laughs> okay, that's only the hobbyist part of this gets confused, right? Musicians as a whole, studio musicians as a whole go in and get good sounds and they don't care how they get good sounds. They just want good sounds. So for instance, um, we focus on that. Say we meaning the hobbyist mentality, this like, Oh, it's not good enough to be professional. The reality is professionals use all kinds of stuff that you would never predict. Um, there are musicians who are famous, world famous musicians who use quality guitars like Gibsons and Fenders on stage, but in the studio used off brand, weir off brand weird stuff because it sounded a little better in the studio or it stayed in tune better or intonated better, or was just a better product to, to have at the time. So, um, and in today's modern studio stuff, so much stuff can be fixed in the mix. Um, I think if, if you're going to worry about studio quality, you should worry about ins being inspired to play right. So if it, if it sounds good to you and it's inspiring to you, you're probably going to do well because that's the biggest problem with anything at studio is how do you keep the, like I said, your tone is not your amp, your speaker, your guitar, your pickups. Your tone is the idea in your head <laughs> to your hands to the strings, to the guitar, to the pickups, to the output jack, you know what I mean, to the amp, to the, the speaker. That's all part of the sound, the tone. It starts with an idea. So whatever helps you communicate that idea out. So I don't really focus on that kind of stuff. Um, like no one ever goes, oh, I'm going to the studio next week. Well, I don't say nobody, but majority don't go into the studio next week and go, oh, I'm going to go to the studio, but I have made in Korea pickups. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a thing i've never heard any studio musicians say that to me i have heard people though like hobbyists and like i said i'm one too so we're all in the same boat come into me and say oh i like this guitar and the pickups sound good but they're made in korea so i need to put something better in them <laughs> i'm like uh, all right <laughs> not like i roll my eyes like they don't know what they're talking about I'm like I, I mean i get it if it's in your head it's real this is an artistic form you know what i mean it's artistic it, it's it's Something that's just this annoying could be the difference to you. Something that just, you know, I've, I've, I've heard it all at this point, <laughs> you know, uh, grumpy. Mike guitar says I was editing a video and missed the start, but glad I made it before the end. Merry Christmas to you and your family. And why not? Cheers. God, uh, uh, thank you. Happy Christmas. Merry Christmas to you as well. Also, have fun editing. Cause I know it's fun editing. You get to learn the fun of editing hours of staring at your face fred says uh hi phil thanks to uh <laughs> thanks oh thanks for being here today best single cut to play metal rock around a thousand bucks uh us uh so he's thousand dollars us uh looking for a, a little sister for my lp traditional tw 2012 any advice i don't know i mean that's a tough you know this is always like 
I mean, I, again, I don't know what to tell you. I can only tell you what I think. I right now, if you had a thousand bucks and I wanted a Les Paul style guitar for metal, I'd buy an Eclipse, uh, an LTD Eclipse. I don't know if I'd exhaust the whole thousand dollars. You can find some of the really sweet ones for eight hundred bucks, maybe used a little less than that. But that's, I'll, I'll tell you that if there's a guitar that's in my craw, so to speak. Uh, for a guitar I, not, is probably an LTD Eclipse. That's a guitar that I've brought up many times on the channel. I just love them. I think they play great. As you guys know, I really like my Les Paul Light uh, that's behind me. That's my Gibson Les Paul Classic that's thinner. It's basically a f very fancy LTD Eclipse, <laughs> right? It's just Gibson doing an LTD Eclipse. Uh, LTD Eclipse is going to have a Les Paul shape, a little thinner, plays great. I was just talking about this yesterday. It's kind of funny. Uh, anyways, um, so that's what I would suggest because I like those guitars and um, they're cool. They're cool. And you and like I said, you don't even probably have to spend a whole thousand. And I think it will rate up there with your Les Paul. Mathis says, hey, Phil, happy holidays from Sweden. Happy holidays, Sweden. My vacation started on the 23rd. Hey, that's cool. <laughs> uh, had trouble swip, uh, switching mindset from work. Yeah, I COVID has just basically made it impossible for me to have this definite line between work and not work. Um, it's just it's just because I'm just stuck here all the time. Uh, it says then I put on your last show and I just immediately relaxed. <laughs> Sincere thank you for helping us keep a sane year. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Uh, it's it's been very. This is probably the first first year I can actually say making content has been therapeutic for me. So when you guys say it, it, it was like nice for you to watch it too. It's it's cool. It makes it fun. That's why I wanted to do this today. I figured some people are busy with their families and doing stuff. Some of us just, you know, like, you know, maybe you're like me and your kids are a little older and they're not opening presents. <laughs> right? We're we're past wrapping anymore at this point. <laughs> Just, we're just handing stuff to each other. Uh, James says, I recently got a PRS Paul's guitar. Okay. And there are weird marks under the finish. Would you contact PRS or the retailer in fear of getting another bad one? Merry Christmas. Love the channel. Um, first, I would always contact the retailer, especially if it's in your 30-day window, you know what I mean, or whatever your return window is. Uh, always give the retailer the opportunity to fix it. Here's why. They might have more power to fix it. The manufacturer is going to probably try to first try to deflect you to the retailer. Look, there's a reason why manufacturers uh, like Fender who sell direct uh, really have no clue how much work is involved selling product, right? Uh, retailers, the retailers not just there so you can physically click a button and have it shipped to you or, you know, or, or you can walk in their store and touch it. I know we think that way. Like, Oh, I bought it from retail cause I could touch it. A retailer's real job is taking care of people. That's the thing that the fa think about this. That's what the factory can't do. A factory can make a guitar and ship you a guitar. So can a retailer, but the factories are not set up to hand. I just told you like PRS, their customer service department. I bet you it's like two people. I'm not even exaggerating. I mean, maybe it's five. I don't know. But it's not, it's not a hundred, <laughs> right? Um, so, so my point is, is that I think you'll get more personal service and, and with the retailer. Now, sometimes you contact the retailer and they don't take care of you. That's just a sign of bad retailer. And then that's when you would try to, def, you know, go to the, to the manufacturer. But here's what, here's why I'm also telling you this. What you want to do at this point is they can't fix that. You didn't say if you have an SE or a core, it doesn't matter. They can't fix it. You're talking about uh, you're talking about issues underneath the finish. Nobody can buff that out. The only thing they can do is strip the finish. If it's an SE, they probably won't even do that. They'll probably just literally, you know, be stock it or do whatever. You know what I mean? They do to it, give it to an artist. Uh, it'll just go back or the retailer will sell it as B stock or something, right? It's discounted. But at this point I'd contact the retailer and ask for a swap out. Uh, my guess is from the guitars I've seen, Paul's guitar. Well, like I said, we're, I, you didn't say SE or core. So I'll just cover both because it can pertain to both people. Both people have both. If it's an SE, my guess is if it's bad, it's still not, it's not going to be all of them. Like they can't, you know, they're not going to have a bad run that long. So you'll be fine if you get another one it, from experience. If it's the core, it's probably definitely, definitely just that one guitar because sometimes they have issues with all kinds of stuff. But there you go. I've seen it all. Like PRS is not, uh, you know, un unfallible. They make just as much mistakes as anybody else. They're just, uh, PRS is where I've seen PRS always excel is their fret work. 
I very rarely see bad fret work on their guitars, which is why I'm always excited about their guitars. Finish wise, I think they do just as good and bad as most anybody in the in their market. So what I mean by that is when I see SEs with finish mark, I see, uh, finish flaws, I see just as many uh, Indonesian finished flaws or Korean made finished flaws as them. And when I see American ones, the same, they're, they're not better than anybody in that regards, but they definitely seem to handle fret fit and finish fret work and how well the guitar plays better than most players, uh, most companies. Sean says, <sighs> he says a little $10. He said, Dala, Dala, holla. Merry Christmas, bud. I appreciate that. Especially since I had to figure out how to say $10 holla. So I did it. Uh, NM says, Merry Christmas. Have you ever tried uh, Aristides? I have not, but I met a nice gentleman at, uh, when I bought my Gretsch guitar in the parking lot. You're noticing a trend. One thing about YouTube is I spend a lot of time in parking lots now talking to strangers. Um, do with that information what you will, but that's absolutely true. I think I have, even in, during COVID, it's just with a mask six, seven feet away, talking in a parking lot. Seems to be the thing. Um, and uh, he's local, a very nice gentleman, uh, and he has some Aristides, and he was uh, talking about letting me borrow one. And, um, you know, I've just been trying to get through this uh, Christmas season, you know, with workload. But it's a guitar I really want to put my hands on. I mean, really bad. I mean, you know, I think they're really cool. I love the whole concept of them. I love the look at them. I like everything about them. I like the company. So there you go. Uh Chris Randall says, is your Les Paul light headstock heavy? Nope, it's not, because uh, the guitar is not that light. So it's, uh, the guitar is about seven and a half, eight pounds. So it's not, I would imagine though, like I, when I got that one, um, cause that came from American Musical Supply. So American Musical Supply does not weigh the guitars like Sweetwater. And maybe that was good for me because if I got it from a Sweetwater, it wasn't an option. They don't, they don't carry them. But if they got it from Sweetwater, I would have probably picked the lightest one. And I would imagine, just like a, an SG, if you get one in the six and a half to seven pound range or a little lighter, maybe it would probably start being a little headstock heavy. Um, so something to think about. If yours is headstock heavy, uh, if that's an issue, like if you end up getting one and yours is headstock heavy, uh, it's up to you. I mean, you know, there's, there's obviously all kinds of re uh, things you can do. But uh, the one thing I don't love about that guitar is I'm not a huge Grover a uh, uh, tuner fan. I mean, you know, and it's not even locking ones. You could switch them to a lighter ultralight locking key and that would fix the problem. So you just have to think about doing that. And uh, I probably end up doing that on mine eventually anyways, even though it doesn't need it. Okay. Um, okay, hold on. Oh, angry shoebox. This is, I try to stay away from the question so much about me, but this one might be insightful. Uh, says, Phil, what was your first gig level guitar? I think my first gig, well, I mean, here's the thing. I got my Aria Pro 2 XR, XS, it was X something. And uh, I played, I mean, I gigged. I mean, I played in bands and played all over town and stuff. You know what I mean? So I was gigging with it. It was, it was fine. It stayed in tune. It sounded great. Um, so that was, uh, that was my first gig level guitar. The, the interesting thing about this is the, the funny thing, like I said about that's weird about this is there's, what do you need? Right? Remember my quote earlier uh, in the show? Uh, the quote where I said, um, Hold on a second. The quote where I was talking about, you know, choosing to buy a cheap guitar versus having to choose to buy a cheap guitar. I have played gigs with gear that is insufficient to play gigs with. Um, the uh, I have all the stories that most of you are going to have. I, I once was in a band where the bass player had a one eight inch speaker combo bass amp. So we hung it from the garage, you know, the beam for the garage door, for the garage door opener, we hung it. <laughs> we, we tied a rope around the handle and hung it, hung it so it was ear level. So when he's playing bass, we could hear him. And then me and the other guitar player, because we didn't know any better, plugged into some kind of solid state PV guitar head that had two inputs, thinking that that meant it, had, it was a two guitar, you know, two guitar head. But of course, one was 
one was a lower, you know, uh, decibel input and one was the regular. So one of us couldn't get heard all the time, but we didn't know, by the way, we just like, I don't know why your guitar is louder today. Or like the next day we're like, man, you were playing way louder today than you were yesterday. We didn't know it was the randomness of which one plugged in the first or the, uh, the higher output our input pack, pick a uh, input stage on the amp. Sorry. Um, so, and then we played gigs with that. <laughs> right. Um, and, uh, you know, you, 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 you use what you got <laughs> and then you try to get better gear. The thing about that, which was nice is this is where I, maybe, uh, things I've learned from experiences, you know, you used to videotape, literally videotape for you younger viewers. <laughs> Uh, I used to videotape the shows. Every show I played, we'd videotape it. And when you watch the videotape, you could figure out. You didn't need anybody to tell you. You didn't need a sound guy to tell you. You could figure out in the videotape, like, okay, I need a better amp. Or the bass player needs this. Or you could figure out from the recordings what you guys needed. Or the, the drummer really needs to buy a better snare. <laughs> you know what I mean? You could figure that stuff out real fast. But gig gigging equipment is, I, I'll tell you this. I would rather play music on crappy gear than not play music and uh, like i said th that's it I, I always i always want to remind everybody this it's just an interesting point it's i can't remember talk about a question if you asked me which you didn't but i'm going to say you because somebody asked me this question i can't remember being unhappy with my gear I, I have no moment in my life there was no moment ever that i ever woke up and went Everything sucks. If I can just get a Marshall and a Gibson, I will be happy. Now, I've heard people say that, but I never, ever thought that. I always had fun. I've always had fun. And then what happens is I just, because I, I, I hyper-focused on it, I just wanted to improve it. I'm like, you know, hey, I have a crate amp. Like I said, uh, I, I had a, uh, eventually I got a crate amp. So I had an Aria Pro into a crate amp. And I was like, this is great. Until one day you're you're playing with somebody else. I think with my, me it was I was playing a crate amp, which I did like, and I probably still do a little bit. But I we auditioned a new guitar player. We didn't take him in the band, by the way. But he showed up with a Marshall, and man, it really made me hear how much better. <laughs> he didn't wasn't the right fit for the band, but definitely his his sound was great. You know what I mean? Um, and so so like I said, I never remember being unhappy. Like I never. I never plug into anything and go, oh man, this is just horrible. So I just like playing music. Uh, so it's all about playing music. But then unfortunately, you collect and you grow and you change. And sometimes it's a focus on improving your sound for your music. Sometimes it's about improving your sound because you have money and time because you work your ass off all the time. Sometimes that's a factor too. It's just, you know, right? People try to always insinuate, like when they call a PRS a doctor's lawyer's guitar, like that's a negative thing. And I'm like, you know what? I think it's cool. Doctors and lawyers. Look, I want my doctor and my lawyer to play guitar that's badass by the way my doctor does play guitar so you know, so, you, so you know um so that's badass right um i love that i love the idea that if i get pulled over by a cop he plays guitar because <laughs> that made me get me out of the ticket i'm like oh you play strats i play strats we don't really need to do this today do we <laughs> Um, Tony says, Tony Gorbin says, there is no crappy gear, only crappy musicians. Sure. Of course. Right. Um, it, it's, it's, uh, I think like I said, gear can hinder you for sure. And you have to work past that. And we've seen in, in music history, the only thing I love talking about more than gear is music, by the way, we've seen it over and over bands. How many bands have created amazing sounds because of not having good gear? You know what I mean? There is tons of that. There are stories riddled through this industry of someone playing a guitar that wasn't that great or an amp that wasn't that great or they didn't have the right studio mic or the right room to record in. And for some reason, it just worked. And, uh, you know, it's, hey, think about this. There are tons of stories about scratch tracks being recorded that ended up being the main track because when they finally got the right stuff, it just wasn't right. It wasn't the right situation. So, yeah, it's a, it's fun. But like I said, that's why I said it's hard. It's hard. That's why when I, I hear people say, uh, and it's always a it's always a, a, a perception thing. I'll hear somebody go, how come YouTubers don't call out crappy gear? And I go, here's why, okay? If it's defective, it's crappy, 
right? If it doesn't do the thing it's supposed to do, then of course it's, it's defective. It's broken, right? If it's broken, it's broken. That happens. But it's sometimes hard. And, and it's happened to me more times than not in editing, by the way. I'll do a, vi a video. I'll say something. I'll be like, this tone is flat and lifeless. And then I'm editing and I watch myself say it and I listen to it and I go, you know, it's not my cup of tea. Maybe I should rephrase that. And I'll go and rephrase it. It has nothing to do with the company because it's probably a guitar, like for instance, that I bought. It's, it's maybe that's not the thing to say because that's just slapping someone. What if somebody likes that tone, recorded their song with their band that tone, and here I am calling the tone of their band flat and lifeless. Is that the right statement? And I go, so I'll, I'll re-edit it and I'll maybe say something like, uh, this tone, it doesn't have the higher end harmonics or the higher end uh, frequencies that I I prefer. Again, it's an art form. So we you want to be, you don't have to kid glove everything, but like I said, sometimes you want to think about the fact that the truth is some people are able to pull. And plus, you don't also want to be the person who says something sucks. That's another thing that's important. You, you guys think about companies all the time for some reason. You guys are, viewers sometimes are more hyper-focused on companies than anyone else. YouTubers, when they're in a group, we don't talk about companies. It's like, that's the part we don't care about, <laughs> right? Um, here's what I was going to say. You don't worry about what the company thinks per se. The reality is 90% of the companies don't watch the content anyways. So even if that was something you were concerned about, it doesn't exist. Uh, there is no channel that I've ever met, including myself, that doesn't have, I have a dozen of these, by the way, stories, where it's a company send you a nasty email saying, hey, Phil, when are you going to make that video on the guitar? And I go, yeah, I did it seven months ago. Thanks for paying attention. <laughs> oh, by the way, got a ton of views. Cool. Thanks for, I re remember when you said you love my channel. Apparently not so much because you didn't even Google it. <laughs> so anyways, um, that's a real story, by the way. It not only happened to me a bunch of times, but there's one time I like to always point out. I once was told that by a company who I just ironically not only did the video uh, three months pri previous, but it was the number one watch video on YouTube. And if you Google the company's name, that video came up first. So they literally sent me this email. And it was the reason it was embarrassing was is because they said, hey, are you ever going to get to that video? And I thought to myself, how do I tell them? I already did, and it's your record video <laughs> without sounding like a condescending, like, jerk, <laughs> right? So I just went, uh, yeah, um, I, I forgot what I said. I think I said I was going to get to it because I just was, I was embarrassed, so you know. I just didn't want to be the person be like, yeah, I did it. <laughs> it was good. You didn't watch it? Thanks. Anyways, back to the important part what what uh when you the reality of when you're reviewing gear or you're talking about guitars and amps and pedals and stuff is that the people who watch it own it it's called confirmation bias it's not it's not it's not a, it's not a, not, a, not, a, not nothing unheard of okay the reality is is if i make a video tomorrow about a pedal the reality is that 40% of the views will be people who have already bought the pedal. They want to see what somebody else thinks of it. doesn't mean I have to say nice things so that they feel good about themselves, but I have to be aware of the fact, I think you should be aware of the fact that if they like the product, all they want to know is if you've discovered anything wrong with it or any issues you found, or they also want to see what things you found that are great about it. They don't need to hear you go, oh, I think anyone who buys this uh, pedal just tone deaf. <laughs> That's this is out right. Uh, I think I think I've told you this before. I call it mom's cooking. It's my opinion. Mom's cooking. If I go to someone's house, their mom makes me a meal, and it's horrible. I'm going to tell them, like, it's their mom's cooking, right? Don't insult their mom. So I try to say everything with honesty, but also. If I can avoid uh, slapping someone in the face, I'll try to take that route whenever I can. Sometimes it's unavoidable. Sometimes. Uh, let's see. Hmm. Skeptic, I don't think he's talking to me. I think he's talking to somebody else. He's saying, it's a great guitar. It's just a bit heavy. I think he's actually talking to somebody else, but that's a perfect thing. Like, that stuff, if you notice, that I say all the time. Like, think about that. I could rephrase that statement he just put to... It was an okay guitar, but it's heavy as crap, and only a moron would want this, <laughs> right? You can imagine that's a different vibe. All right, let's back on. <laughs> oh, no. Martin Leahy just said, I just ordered the Nux Steel uh, Singer just for the hell of it to try it out. Well, you have to let us know if it's any good. I'm sure it's good. I think, think about this. I think uh, both those companies, Vertex and uh, New X, is, I, th I call, 
I call it New X. I'm pretty sure they're New X. It's not Nux, but it's New X. Both those companies I think make good stuff. Scott says, Phil, you never say anything sucks. I think uh, you're safe influencer on the market with. Yeah, that's not true. <laughs> so, so Scott, um, I, I can, I'm never gonna uh, list the companies, but to say a dozen would be just a joke. It would be like 30 companies hate my guts, hate it. Like, I mean, publicly, they'll even tell you publicly they don't like me because I've said horrible things about their products. See what I'm saying? And you're like, probably like most people going, no, I've watched all your videos or I've watched a big, and I'm, you've never said anything. If you watch what I'm saying, what I say is actually sometimes I was told uh, by a company I, I respect and who, who respects me, but we did have, you know, they didn't like a video I made because <laughs> of the things they said. And they illustrated it the best to me out of any company I've ever heard. They said, it's not that, because if I was saying those things, like it sucks or, you know, it's dumb that wouldn't really hurt or upset them. What upsets them is that I'm critiquing it in a way that is, uh, what do they say? It basically has more merit because of the fact that I go with a critique instead of a slam. Does it make sense? If you slam something, it's easy to brush off. You know what I mean? Um, so hold on. Scott says, if you do, you say it in such a smooth way. Yeah, it's also, too, what you guys are paying attention to versus what they're paying attention to, right? Let me give you an example. If I say, uh, I'll pick on a guitar, it's easy. I'll pick on the Scratch. If I say, this Scratch is great, but uh, I, I hate the color black. Gretch isn't going to get upset about that. They don't care if I don't like the color. Um, what they, what trick, I'll tell you the triggers that seem to upset companies, really fast first of all anytime and see what this is what i'm saying what you guys don't hear and what you guys may what you guys and hold on somebody says it's gotta be wampler no me and wampler brian are good we've done a bunch of videos and talked since uh since when he got upset with me <laughs> um and uh but again same thing it's it's again it's the the that actually is a perfect example the thing that really triggers people out for for companies is when i when you talk about value Right. Um, and, and so, and so much so, unfortunately I've been in this rock and a hard place, like a lot of channels, uh, and where I talk about it almost in every video, even though I know that's the thing that's probably going to trigger the thing that upsets a company. So you guys want me to talk about it. You want YouTubers, you want everybody to talk about it. We all want somebody to go, okay, this guitar is $1,500. Is it worth $1,500? That's what you want to hear. That's the thing that I found in the past and in currently that triggers the companies the most. When I say, oh, it's not worth it. That's what they, they get upset about. They don't care if you don't like the color or if the input jack's in the wrong spot or if the knobs are squeaky. They don't care about that stuff. At least not that I've ever seen. They care about when you, anytime you talk about value, that seems to be a trigger. There's a cut bunch, but that one's a big one for sure. So, so and again, it's, it's why... It's why we do the live show every week, so we can talk about this stuff. Uh, I uh, <laughs> Anthony says Gibson cough cough. It's just, here's what's funny. You guys don't have to worry about it. It's funny because um, what I will tell you is it's easy to figure out. <laughs> it, if a company uh, doesn't like a channel, it's fine. Is they like other channels? There's just always a there's always a vibe that fits. Yeah, <laughs> hold on. John says facts are more powerful than opinions. That's a good out. That's a good insight. Um, I would add to it that unfortunately most opinion facts are not facts. You know what I mean? That's the problem in a review structure. This green is too green. That's not a fact. That's an opinion. So you're like stick to the facts, but the factual things are almost non-existent in 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 our gear. Like here's a fact. Like I've talked about this before. Car seat. If a car seat does not do its job, that's a fact. It's not safe. Fact, right? It it fails, okay? If a guitar doesn't have a good tone, that's not a fact. That's still always going to be opinion. It's a little tricky. I think we're kind of beating this subject to dead. We're going to move on. <laughs> uh, you can hear kids, like, screaming outside playing. I don't know if you guys can hear them, but I can hear them. All right. Uh, let's get to the next one because we're, we're getting a little long in this show, too. 
The next one comes from Harrison. It says, Merry Christmas. Phil donated two guitars for vets this holiday. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. It's always nice uh, you know, to do something like that. Plus, I know you guys are doing it because I, I mentioned the charity too, and I appreciate that. It says, thanks for uh, turning me on to them. Uh, I got a Made in Japan Fender Strat from 88 for Christmas. That's a great gift, right? Uh, I absolutely love the feel and the tone of it. Any experience with them? Yeah, of course. Um, you know, the the that's the time. You got to stand Fender, you know, of course, uh, it, it gets purchased by the investors and the employees from CBS, and that happens in the late 80s. And then there's this time where that's where the a record amount of Japanese guitars from Fender come out. And of course, they were there. Everybody knows they're fantastic. So they're fantastic guitars. They have great necks. They feel great. They sound great. They're highly collectible. They're very cool. And um, you know, and and the good thing is they're slowly. They just keep going up in value. So it's a cool thing to have. And then, of course, it's a cool thing later and have to because you'll get your money out of it, you know, or make some money, which usually it's just as long as you get your money out of it. That's always that's always a nice dividend. If you get to enjoy something for 10, 20 years and then get your money back out of it when you're done with it. So very cool guitar. But, yeah, first of all, we all kind of know made in Japan, always just beautiful craftsmanship, you know, uh, beautiful luthiers. And so they make great guitars. Uh, very few Japanese guitars are bad. Even what we now refer to as like the cheap junky ones from back in the day, now looking back are better than we thought because <laughs> we used to go, oh, well, they're not that great. Now we play them and go, well, we didn't know how bad it could get. <laughs> Kevin did a super chat for no reason. I appreciate the Kevin. Happy holidays to you. Tom says, I'm building a music master like guitar from Mustang parts with only the neck pickup. I like the texture of, of the low output pickups and I want to try a P90. Recommendations, thinking about the, the Fraylin hum canceling P90s. I'm a, I'm a Fraylin fan. So P90s, like I said, I like almost all P90s because that's what I said. But by design, it's a cheap pickup, which is what's great about it. Some of my favorite P90s would definitely be like the DiMaggio ones, the the Fraylin ones for sure. Um, the Gibson ones are okay. Like I don't, I wouldn't specifically, me personally, wouldn't buy an aftermarket Gibson P90 pickup to put in a guitar. It's not something I, I seek out. If I was gonna put P90s in one of my guitars, I would probably, for me, go with the DiMaggio's that I like or the, the Fraylin's hum canceling ones. I definitely like the Fraylin ones and the, uh, probably the most because they're really good. Lin Lindy just makes good pickups. He just, he just does. So, I think it's a good way to go. Can't go wrong. It's a good quality pickup. James says, recently got a PRS Paul's guitar. Oh, no, we just talked about that one. I must have did them out of order. Um, Yeah, because it backtracked on me a little bit. All right, so Jack T says, Jack T-E-E, -E, not T like the letter T, T, says, thank you for all you do. Happy holidays. Happy holidays back at you, Jack. Davis says, uh, my family thinks I'm nuts for asking for Stu Mac tools for Christmas. Okay, figured I'd share my joy with another crazy person. Merry yeah, you know what, though? That's the best way to get those damn tools. They're expensive. So if you can get somebody to... <laughs> um, my buddy Joe, you, <laughs> you guys probably know my buddy Joe. My buddy Joe used to do this thing I thought was genius. He would send everyone in his family a list of pedals every year. And so every birthday and every Christmas, it was either buy him the pedal or get in cahoots with another family member and then buy the pedal. And that's how he built up his pedal collection. And I thought that's ingenious. Cause he would just tell, and he would stay focused on it year after year, only buy pedals, only buy pedals. Right. And, uh, and I think it's cause I, well, obvious reasons, cause that's how you get good pedals, but also I think it was cause he likes high end pedals, but he didn't like to buy them. So that's a great way to kind of soften the blow of that. So I, th I think that's a good, good idea with Stu Mac stuff. Um, you know what I mean? <laughs> so yeah, you know, to, cause like I said, it's, it's pricey. It's, pricey um okay we did uh eddie eddie said merry christmas merry christmas dp says hey phil any thoughts on the yamaha river star oh rev star i don't know why i say river rev star 502 t or the rev the rev star series in general i love my five uh 50 502 t i don't know why i'm saying it that way 502 t <laughs> 502 2T. Merry Christmas. Phil, all the best. Um, I'm a big Yamaha fan. I've, I've said this before. It's one of those things. You know, it's funny was that was what a guitar. I was actually going to get a, uh, a rep, a, not a rep. I was going to get a Yamaha guitar on the channel for the holidays for review. 
and I dropped the ball. Uh, and that's kind of it worked out because that's how I ended up getting the Squire. I bought the Squire and did the Plex video because I already decided I was going to do a video where I buy a guitar and talk about it for, you know, for the holidays. And the, but that, that guitar, the Yamaha guitar was actually the one in my craw first, but they ran out of stock. So then I was like, okay. And I had a list of ideas and the, and the Squire Plex idea has been this idea I've been running in my head for a year that I was curious about. Um, so, uh, that's something I've been trying to focus on. If you notice, I did it a little bit this year I'm to focus on it more next year, which is, you know, not waiting every time for a company that to, to work with you, you know, just kind of doing it yourself kind of, you know, and figuring it out in that way. And I've been doing it and pulling it off. It's been working very good. And you guys' response to it has been really good. So we'll keep it going. Jose Benito Martinez Jr. says, will Ralph join you for a live podcast soon? Happy holidays. I don't know. You know, we, I, I always tell you guys I'm thinking about getting him to come on a Saturday and do it. Every Saturday he's come over and I said, hey, you want to go do a live podcast? He, no. So it's uh, it's not his thing. But I'll get him back. You know what? Maybe that's the focus for New Year's. New Year's. Maybe instead of next week, I'll, I'll, I'll let you guys know. I'll put I'll put a message out. Um, I don't know if I'll if it, if I do next Friday show I'll do next Friday show. But if I can get him for next Saturday show New Year's Day I'll do New Year's Day with Ralph. Maybe that'd be fun. Uh, Sphinx I'm gonna say MTN Mountain <laughs> says any thoughts? Oh no no okay same th different question. Any thoughts on the P90 pickups? I just paid for a positive grid spark. Still have not plugged into anything. Any thoughts on P90? I like P90s. I, like I said, I'm a P90 fan. Um, I have three guitars with P90s, and I play them like crazy. So I like P90s. Um, the, uh, in fact, I, I have my P90SG. I, I kind of want to get a P90 Les Paul, but you know, it just seems kind of silly at this point to get you know another Les Paul just for different pickups. But I love P90s, so that's easy. That's my thoughts on P90s. Congratulations on the Spark. I still love mine. So that's always nice to hear, right? Uh, I like to give you guys, that's one thing about the Friday show too, is I, when you guys talk, we talk about product, I can give you updates. I'm still using my Spark every day. It's still it's still a, a great quality product. I'm very happy with it. So uh, Litve says, Merry Christmas to those who celebrate it. See, thank you for, that's great. It says, any wonderful, oh, and a wonderful season for everyone else. Yeah. Drop it in to say hi, but I'll watch tomorrow. Please do not make the joke. Don't. Question, <laughs> germanium clipping overdrives. Okay, so I'm not making the joke about the fact that tomorrow will be today, and this is now, but this was yesterday. Um, what I will say is, you know, I used to start, I started at, a, especially when the YouTube channel started, I started really learning more and more about pedals. And and here's why I was like, like everybody I was getting into pedals, right? Cause pedals came late for uh, like me for like a lot of players. I think a lot of you too. In fact, if it wasn't for YouTube, I wouldn't have got into pedals. That was uh, something I penned to talk about. This is great. Litve, great, great segue into this. Um, last week we were talking about, um, glary guitars and somebody was talking about YouTube hype and I was, and they were saying, you know, it's all YouTube hype. And I, I have a theory on YouTube hype. Let me give it to you uh, like this. Until YouTube, everybody talked about YouTube in so many ways, but until YouTube, I never cared about pedals. <laughs> My whole life in music, I was into guitars, I was into amps, and I would buy some pedals. You know, I, I need a delay pedal. Everything was functional for me. Like, I need a delay, so I got a delay. I needed a chorus, so I tried all the chorus, I bought a chorus. I didn't have 10 delays, and I didn't have 10 overdrives, and I didn't have five choruses. Then none of that existed. And then... YouTube took off, right? YouTube, 2007, whatever, right? And then all of a sudden, you're watching YouTube videos. And here's why I know YouTube has some kind of influence. And that's why it's important, I think, that YouTubers be upfront as much as they can. Because um, when people talk about stuff, I don't think they realize what's going on uh, with the psyche of it. Here, Here's what I find interesting. Just an observation, okay? I Pre-YouTube, I could probably name... 50 guitar players that I know personally that would have 10 guitars and two amps and they would have eight pedals and they would go, Oh, I'm getting a new overdrive. I found a new overdrive. And I love it. And as soon as they buy it, they sold their overdrive and they still had eight pedals. They would collect guitars. Like they, it always works that way. You buy an amp and a guitar. Everybody buys one amp, one guitar. Then they buy two guitars, then three guitars, 
Usually never second amp. Second, more amps comes later. You always built a guitar collection. When I go on YouTube now and I watch all the channels on YouTube, and I don't mean the YouTuber channels that are, you know, that are actually, you know, trying to make content and build, you know, followings and stuff. I'm talking about just even average, average player, you know, right? Maybe he's got 15 subscribers. I see this trend that's definitely something that you never saw until post YouTube. They have like five guitars, they have 400 pedals, and they have two amps. And I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm saying it's just an observation that I never saw that before. It never existed. All of a sudden, this pedal collecting thing. And I'm just as guilty because I, like I said, I, I'm back. In fact, so you guys know, I think I we talked about this on the podcast, but it's been so long now. The old way the room used to look, if you remember, it was a row of guitars and there was the row, the two shelf lines of pedals and then amps. And the reason why the room got changed was everyone would ask, everyone's questions were so focused on pedals with me. And here's what I, uh, one day I just hit me like a ton of bricks. Okay. I was looking at it going, 40% of my questions are about pedals. I don't even use pedals, <laughs> but it's because they're right there where you guys saw them. And I'm like, and they're there because companies were sending them like water. Um, I was getting a pedal every week, maybe two pedals every week. And I mean, like they just showed up. They just show up at your at your address, pedals. Companies were just sending out pedals, 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 pedals. And it wouldn't stop. And so you would check them out, but, it, but I wasn't super interested in them. So I, I really think that's why I really appreciate channels like the pedal show, because that pedal show they are actual pedal connoisseurs and they're lovers of pedals. And that's why I backed off pedals so much. I'm not saying I'm not going to talk about pedals. As you guys know, I like my Lawrence pedals. I like Keeley. I like pedals. Uh, the, the, the new X, when I like a pedal, I talk about it, but I stopped ta doing so much pedal stuff because not because pedals are wrong and not because I'm trying to say you shouldn't buy pedals. I'm saying it's definitely, it became a thing in my psyche. Like, are, am I buying pedals? Cause I like pedals or am I buying pedals? Because 90% of the videos I'm watching are about pedals. So I made this conscious decision to back off and hopes actually, so you guys know that you guys and me myself could enjoy the real guys who like pedals more and I'll focus more on guitar stuff. And that's why I made that change. So the reason I, uh, that ties into this, this question <laughs> is, uh, the Germanian clipping overdrives. Here's what I learned when I was hyper-focused in my YouTube channel early days on, uh, pedals. I used to talk about that stuff but because that's what everybody was talking about. But deep down, I don't care. I don't know why. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care what's in a pedal anymore. You know, and I, as you guys know, I, I'm good friends with Lawrence. And if you guys know Lawrence Petros, he's one of the smartest guys I know. And he knows more about pedals than probably anyone I know. I mean, he's up there with the, 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 the guys that know stuff. Okay. And uh, he talks about that stuff to me all the time. And I notice, like sometimes I'm just like floating in and out my attention on him. And ultimately, all I want to get to is the part where he lets me plug into it and hear it. And I go, yeah. So I don't I don't care. In fact, um, uh, over time, I've actually forgot more all about it. Like I can't even like I used to I know like two years ago for a fact, I could probably tell you what what uh, transistors were in all my fuzz pedals, whether they were germanium or silicon or whatever. Now I can't remember. And that just tells me a lot there, too. So. I'm still going to collect pedals, as you guys know. <laughs> I'm just, I've just realized I'm more into guitars than pedals. So that's where I focus my, my stuff. And I thought that was a great way to segue into that. Um, so, uh, so uh, to your question, Germanian clipping overdrives. Look, if an overdrive sounds good, uh, it, it is good. I got yesterday the Mojo Mojo by TC Electronics. I bought it used from, um, from Zim's Guitars. I went stop by yesterday because I finished my day half day yesterday. Uh, I told my wife I'd be working all day Christmas Eve. And so she went and hung out with her friend and my kids went and did their stuff. And then by one o'clock in the afternoon, I was done for the day. So I didn't know what to do with myself. Cause I, I knew if I stayed home, I'd just go to work. So I went to Zim's and I, I, I got a Mojo Mojo TC pedal. Don't know what's in it. We'll see if it's any good. <laughs> okay. Uh, Andy says been saving for an EVH Wolfgang and red stripe guitar, uh, pay the piper or wait to buy it used down the road. Um, if it was, it was me and I really wanted the stripe striped Wolfgang, uh, I would go to whichever I would contact your favorite, uh, retailer, right? So if it's a mom and pop and you trust them, go to them. If it's a online dealer, go to them, right? Uh, you know, like I said, you know, whoever you trust the most. Okay. And get it on order. Just put it on order. 
it'll come eventually. My guess is the used prices will not subside on Eddie Van Halen product, EVH, okay? So, so again, uh, very important. I know uh, this is important to always disclose this stuff. Opinion, right? This is opinion. I, no magic Ouija board here. But I don't think Music Man, uh, Wolfgang, or EVH, not not Music Man, EVH, Eddie Van Halen, Wolfgang's, uh, Wolfgang, uh, EVH, uh, PV stuff, all that stuff they don't make anymore, that stuff, it's never coming back down. Okay. I don't know if it'll stay. Well, I, I already said that it'll, it'll never come down. It's going to be expensive forever. If they don't make it anymore. And it was, it was an Eddie Van Halen product. It's, it's, if you're thinking about buying that stuff, I, I, I don't, I hate to give advice and then it bites you in the ass later because I feel guilty, but I, I got to tell you what I just think when my gut says, my gut says buy it now or buy it when you can, because it's not coming down. Okay. I have a PV Wolfgang. I paid $1,400 for it last year. It was a really big struggle for me because I thought that was a lot of money. I thought it was way too much, but I really wanted the color and stuff. Now people are trying to ask $3,000. I don't think it's worth $3,000, but I can tell you right now, I wouldn't sell it to anyone for, for, for two grand right now to no one for no forever. There's no way I'd have to like, you know, I'd have to be in a bread line. So, so the point of that is, is I think that's going to be the case with that stuff. Now, the production stuff, Eddie Van Halen, EVH, the brand, production stuff, guitars, amps, pedals, uh, that stuff, there is no, not that I've heard in in the back line of this and out in the internet where you guys are at, I have not heard anyone talk about cutting any of the product lines, any issues. Everything is just because there was a huge demand because on Eddie passed away and of course we have COVID. So what that means is what that product's coming and when it comes, it'll be the price that it was before. And if it does go up in price, it'll be a small amount. But usually if you put it in order with the retailer, the retailer will honor it. Um, and so, you know, that's not always the case with the manufacturer. So, so please understand it is, uh, so if you buy a guitar like that for $14.99, I think it's $15.99 now, but anyways, $14.99, $1,500 from a retailer that you trust. That's why I said trust. If, if EVH decides on January 12th to raise the prices 10%, the retailers genuinely, generally, why am I having trouble with genuinely and generally generally will follow uh, or will honor the price they quoted you. That's why you want to get in line for it because it is likely that next year with COVID the, 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 the year we've had the, the demand on those guitars, right? Everything that they could raise prices 10%, right? Uh, on those guitars, 10, 20%, right? Whatever they can get away with, they might pull, right? Um, and you'll be locked in at the right price and you'll be safe. If they don't raise the prices, that's fine. You're still locked in and get it before somebody else. So I would, if you want any EVH branded product, I would put it on order with someone you trust. And the reason I say someone you trust is because you don't want the retailer to, e to email you in six months and saying, oh, we've, we've canceled your order. You want to be able to, somebody you know that's going to take care of it. Um, uh Ed, Ed says, does the USA PV Wolfgang have uh, nitro lacquer? I don't know. Uh, but I can tell you this, uh, Ed. I'll tell you what I'll do. Um, I'll, I'll blacklight mine. I'll check mine uh, tonight. And uh, I'll make a note next week if I can just mention it next week, if that helps. Uh, you know, uh, so I'll do it. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, so that's my opinion on the EVH stuff and what you probably should do if you're trying to get that stuff. Um, okay, hold on. We're going to go over two hours. There's no way. Okay. Judson Grove says, Phil, if you were a lefty and wanted Gibson to make a lefty run of Les Pauls, how would you proceed? Oh, a lefty run of Les Paul lights. I wouldn't, <laughs> I don't, I don't think they're going to do it. The Les Paul light is a guitar that I think is cool as hell, but it always flops. It always does badly. I, like I said, they've produced this the version of this guitar many times. If you look, uh, I think Trogley did a cool video of one because uh, I used to have the other one, the uh, the Les Paul Custom Light with black uh, with gold pickups uh, that I definitely regret selling. <laughs> <laughs> I got rid of it because I had the chunky 50s neck, but now I like that neck. It was just back in the day I didn't. Um, and... Uh, they always failed and they always, you could always pick them up cheap. So I, it's, you know, when product like like that, it's, there's a very niche amount of guys who are that were like, Hey, I want a Les Paul, but I don't want it to be exactly like a Les Paul. Majority of players want Les Pauls to be exactly like they're supposed to. They want to, you know, just a big old Les Paul. So, um, I, you know what I would look into Judson, uh, look into the, like I said, the Eclipse, 
The I want. That's another reason why I want to get LTD Eclipse. The LTD Eclipse is basically that guitar. So I was thinking about getting one and then, you know, modding it up and making it that guitar. Or so we'll see. And uh, and I don't know that they make a left-handed guitar, but I would imagine they would make one. Jason said, Merry Christmas, Phil, and everyone watching. Thanks for everything you've done from the Sharp My Axe on my guitar and the content you put out. You're welcome. Thank you so much. I appreciate that so much. Tony Goyburn says, $20 hollow. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Sorry. What a day to say that. But you caught me off guard. He said, $20 holla. Thanks for this today. Oh, this is going to be a thing. I can tell. $20 holla. I'm going to have to learn how to say it. Uh, I'm uh, I'm by myself, and this is great hanging with all of you. Yeah, you know, I, like I said, I thought it'd be fun. I thought it'd be fun. Uh, and I hope you guys are enjoying it today, too. We'll go, uh, like I said, a few more minutes to make sure we do stuff. Um, I'd stay longer, but I'm going to lose my voice at this point. Uh, Neil, and then I'll go back over. Please, no more super chats. Uh, as much as I appreciate them and stuff, I, I just, I'm not going to answer any more after this one, and then I'll, I'll stay in the main screen for the rest of the time. Uh, Neil B says, best way to donate a guitar to someone who needs one. Man, if you could figure that out, you tell me. My biggest problem on this channel was one of the things I was most excited about is uh, when companies started reaching out, um, you know, everybody, you know, little companies like, uh, you know, uh, not little, I shouldn't say, but like Schecter, right? Schecter Guitars and Ibanez and, and Glary and all these brands there, you know, and I thought, wow, wouldn't this be cool? I had this crazy vision and I'm trying to execute on it still and it's just been a nightmare. Um, and uh, the idea was, you know, send me this guitar, I'll review it, and then maybe fix it up, you know what I mean, in another video, and that'd be a cool video, and then donate it to a kid, right? The whole donating it to someone that can use it. And so you guys know, Guitars for Vets, as much as I talk about them, they don't really take guitar donations either. Um, I've given them guitars in the past, but that's why I stopped, because I gave them guitars, but they sell the guitars, like in raffles and stuff, take the money, and then they buy their acoustic packs that they give the veterans. So once I figured out they're doing that, I just started giving them money, right? Because I was like, oh, that's easier. Just give them money. And I understand their logic. They have a deal with Yamaha. So every veteran gets the same Yamaha guitar, gig bag, strap, lessons. It's a uniform thing. They can, And they have a deal with uh, Yamaha. I think Yamaha sets them up and stuff. So it's just an easy deal. 200 bucks. So they pay 200 bucks and it's a complete package. Uh, so um, what I learned is exactly that. Uh most places want money, not the guitars. So I've given guitars to teachers. I've given guitars to after school programs. Um, I gave a guitar. Same thing as this. I gave a guitar to uh, the uh, to um, Alice Cooper's charity here in town, uh, which is the Teen Center, and that's what they did with the guitar. They end up uh, they 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 um I think they gave it away as a prize uh, for a guitar contest, right? They did something like that, so they found a use for it that way. But uh, it's hard. It's hard to just find somebody that wants a guitar. And I get emails from people saying that, but emails are horrible because, you know, I, I don't know who anyone is. You know what I mean? That's just unsolicited. Like, you know, I, I mean, I, I empathize with the stories I read, but I don't know how accurate they are. And then I got to ship this guitar. So my point is, it's very hard. Uh, Larry Mitchell, who's a good friend of mine, he said guitars to the classroom. I had horrible experience trying to give them anything. I couldn't get them to talk to me. I kept messaging them, emailing them. Uh, and never got a response from them. If they ever, any of you guys know anybody there, tell them I said that. <laughs> so hopefully they'll reach out to me because I can, I, 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 if you heard my videos when I say I give a guitar to a kid or somebody, it's always just a random person. Like a friend of mine says, hey, I, I know this guy at work and his kid wants a guitar and I can give that guitar. So uh, yeah, I, I mean, we're looking for it. Because I, I, like I said, I, I, I always have some guitars. You know, that's the beautiful part of having a channel that you reviews products and the product sticks around. And uh, it'd be nice to give it to somebody who can really appreciate it. That'd be nice. So there you go. Plus, you guys, I get emails from you guys all the time trying to give guitars. Same thing. You guys, hey, I have this guitar and I want to give it to somebody. Who should I give it to? And I'm I, so always uh, email me suggestions. Just put in the subject line so I know to fish it out of the email batches. You know, that it's, you know, that you're you, you know, you know, a donation place where I can do that or and I can suggest you to do it. Uh, and then Pat did a super chat. I said no more, but he just wanted to say thanks for all I do. Uh, I appreciate it. All I do is hang out with you guys. So uh, hopefully that's that's fun. Um, 
Uh, Steve wants to know, so I'm going to try and, you know what I'm going to do for, uh, let's do a, a fun thing. Let me try to find the weirdest questions and hit those. Uh, Steve just did a question. He says, have you ever fretted a guitar with squiggly frets? Uh, that's the true temperament fret system. No, I don't even know how to, com I don't even know how to compliment my scale level is not that, that good. Apparently, uh, I refret all the time, but I don't even understand i would have to not only be taught that but i'd have to at least see one i don't think i've ever physically touched one i think i've seen one at the nam show uh if you guys don't know what he's talking about it's where the frets just type in true temperament frets and uh, maybe i'll put a link when i index it it's just a nightmare of a thing uh looking wise i, I don't even understand how it's sitting in there I, I i don't know if they're glued in or how they're pressed it would be really cool if somebody made a video showing you how to do it i think i could grasp the concept and 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 I would definitely be crazy enough to buy a set and do it to a guitar, <laughs> right? I mean, I would do it just, just for the experience. If you guys notice, a lot of times I'll just do something because I want to see if I can do it because it's just one more feather in the cap kind of thing, you know, to add my skill set. But no, I, I have never done it. Don't know anything about it. The Panda says, what PRS is the next, is that, wait, what PRS is that next to the Plect Squire on the wall? Uh, well, there's two PRSs, uh, one on each side of the Squire. Get my fat head out of the way. Uh, the one on, uh, well, for those podcast uh, listeners, uh, one is my blue hollow body two PRS. That was my birthday present this year. Uh, I'd say for my wife, I guess it's for my wife. She's the one that told me to get it. And, uh, the other on the side is my, uh, the other one is my brown Mira. And the Mira is my, my guitar that I've had the longest. Uh, I bought that in 2013 and that's my main guitar. I refretted it last November with stainless steel frets because I wore the frets on the damn guitar out. <laughs> so there you go. Um, and uh, a funny thing to give you an idea how light that PRS is, the, the Mira, that hollow body is a full hollow body guitar. It's hollow and the Mira is still a little lighter. So those are my two uh, PRSs that I, and then on the other side, uh, is Nathan's guitar, but it's not next to the Squires, but I'm just letting you know, it's the one Nathan made for me. Um, uh, okay. I'm going to try to find something interesting. Oh, uh, Sean, uh, Zimmerman. Uh, thank you. He said PV, he said, he's letting me know that PV for the guy who's questioning about the PV guitar Wolfgang, he says, uh, the U S ones are made, uh, are polyester urethane. So, so, okay. So yeah, polyurethane. So, um, uh, that would make sense. It didn't feel like lacquer to me, but I just didn't know. Mike Sullivan said, he's talking, he's referencing back to when we're talking about the charity thing. He says, too much charity fraud, take care of your own. Yeah, I understand that. You know what I mean? It's, 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 it's great. You know what I mean? Uh, I, I, I whole hundred percent agree with your advice. Um, uh, the, 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 I never had to worry about it before. You know, we always gave to charities in a normal way, like in a way that we, you know, we knew the charity stuff. When I started doing YouTube, I started looking for more charities cause there was like a, Hey, what can I do? You know I mean? With this energy of this YouTube channel, where could I focus that and maybe help some other people like charities and stuff. And Mike, just, so you know, Michael, um, yeah, I found the same thing. Almost most of the charities I found, man, just, it's, it was really depressing. So that's why I said it's not it's not easy to give stuff away. Like people, everybody was like, "Give it away, donate it." By the way, that's how I know you guys are full of crap. Half you guys are like, "Just donate it, give it away." And I'm like, "Well, obviously you don't, because you don't know how hard it is. It's hard. It's hard to find legitimate charities that want to actually take stuff. You know, right? everybody's willing to take a check from you." And so you write a check and send it to them. But like Michael's pointing out, the ones that want the check, some of them just, you know, they embezzle it and it's horrible. Not something we should talk about today. We're talking about good things today. So let's talk about the fact that I really like Guitars for Vets as a charity. And by the way, I like Children's Hospital. Why do I like both those charities? Because I know people who have close people near and dear to my heart that have both benefited from both those organizations. That's why I say that. I, if there's something wrong with those charities, there is, I guess, I, I don't know, but I'm telling you, I, I have someone I love that have been to both those organizations and without them, they would not be the people they are today. So children's hospital hospital and guitars vets is who I've been supporting for that reason, because like Michael said, that that's take care of your own. Th those two organizations took care of people I love. So I've been trying to take care of them back. 
Uh, Otis says, eh. oh, Otis is talking about the squiggly frets, which is the true true temperament. He's saying it comes with an entire fretboard. So they're already mounted on the fretboard. So he, he, uh, that makes sense. And you just put the fretboard on. That makes sense. I might look into it now. I can do that. <laughs> I put on many fretboards. That's not a hard thing to do. Okay. Uh, <laughs> floopity do. <laughs> yeah, go for weird questions right now. It says, how many dairy cows are in Arizona? Uh, a lot. A lot more than you think because everybody needs milk, man. So um, there's a dairy farm by my house and it smells. Sometimes like it, it's like it's not super close to my house, but it's close enough that if every once in a blue moon you, you get the right winds and something happens, you go outside and it's just it's unbearable. Um, so, yeah, we have, a lot of, we have a lot of cows in Arizona. Arizona, I, I, where I live in Phoenix, Arizona is hot as hell, of course, but it looks like California now. It's been Californianized. It's all, people are talking about my video, uh, the lag video I did, and they're like, you have grass? I'm like, yeah, we all have like these small patches. Like, I have a small circle of grass in my backyard. Uh, the Tone King saw a picture of it, and he said it looked like a putting green. That's what it looks like. And in the front of my house, I have like a putting green. <laughs> That's what it looks like. Like you, 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 you that have grass for real, look at my yard and go, why do you have two putting greens? But in it's like this, I don't know, so we can feel like we're we have grass. Uh, I bought the house that came with that. <laughs> if it was me, I'd have ripped it out and just put rock. It's cheaper and because uh, yeah, you don't have to water it. Um, uh, Crusade Music wants to know if I ever built a guitar from scratch. Sure. I usually do one or two a year. The question has been about filming them, right? Like, should I film them and stuff? Um, it's it's usually always attached to a customer and it's always a long-term customer. So it's a, a weird thing. Um, I've had this in and out relationship with this whole marrying my repair life and my YouTube life together. If you notice, I kind of keep them separate. I'll post some of that stuff on, 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 uh, on a patron. And the main reason is, is cause I I've, I've not taken the videos down and but, so they're out there. So I'm, you'll find them, but, um, I have videos where I have taken customers guitars and talked about them on my channel. And what I learned a very harsh lesson was when somebody that loves their guitar that doesn't understand the internet. <laughs> okay. Cause let's face it. Not everybody understands hanging out on Christmas day for two hours talking about guitars. They bring me guitars and I, and I say, Hey, can I film this? And they go, yeah. And there's, they don't understand what they just, uh, just, you know, signed up for. I would do the video and then they would go watch the video and they go, Oh, that was fun. And then they'd read the comments and there was 50 comments about who, what kind of idiot has that guitar and that guitar looks like butt and this guy's a moron for having that guitar and you guys a lot of you are not going to care okay everybody's personality is different but i've had experiences now where i've had one or two or maybe three or four customers um and i'm not dumb okay they didn't say anything to me but they immediately sold those guitars and it's you can tell it upset them so I've been trying to, you know, weigh that out. How do I do that? So I have certain customers that don't care. So I've talked about their product and are their guitars and they're great. I'll continue to do that. But that's why I don't just willy nilly anyone who brings me stuff to show it to you guys. Cause I learned the hard way. You know what I mean? So there you go. Uh, hold on. Uh, hold on. Okay, any any other crazy questions? Like I said, ask me anything crazy right now. Fred Level Midnight says, you now how you you know how you have cows in the desert? It's called irrigation. Yeah, well, of course. We have everything here because like I said, it's not it's not the desert anymore. We pump in all the water. It's all fake. Where I live for those of you that live in other countries and other parts of the United States and maybe not have a reference of Arizona, here's something you probably will find interesting where I live in Phoenix. Most people, when they know about Phoenix, Arizona, they know it's hot. It's 117 in the summer. What most people don't understand is that Phoenix is like one of the largest uh, places for golfing. <laughs> I think we have more golf courses than any other city in the country. It's almost all golf courses here. It's everywhere. They're Golf course there. I don't golf. If I did, it would be like heaven. In fact, anyone who golfs, as soon as they know I live here, they they want to talk to me about all the golf courses here. There's just crap tons of golf courses here. 
because everybody likes to come here when it's snowing where you're at and golf. Today, uh, I don't know what the Celsius is, but to, uh, Fahrenheit, it was 65 was the high today <laughs> on Christmas. So it's 65. You could go golfing today on Christmas. It was a beautiful sunny day. Um, and then the panda says, how often do you see javelinas where you live in Arizona? Saw them a lot in uh, Huchuca. Huchuca. Uh, so I think he's talking about like Fort Huchuca. Um, I've never seen a javelina. <laughs> so because um, like I said, where I live is a city. It gets kind of rural past me. But um, I have seen and I've, I've, I've lived in Arizona since I want to say 86, 1986. That sounds about right. Maybe 85. And uh, I've seen maybe one scorpion, maybe two. I mean, besides when we went scorpion watching, <laughs> that's a thing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> which I think we paid to do that. Uh, I've seen maybe one or two scorpions. I've seen maybe two or three dead rattlesnakes. I've never seen a live one, thank goodness. And uh, I've never seen a javelina. Yeah, so. But they're out there. I see coyotes. Coyotes come in my neighborhood and kill my cats, but I think that happens in California and other places too. I don't think that's an Arizona thing. Ah, George uh, George says, do you have to have special tools to fix uh, fret sprout when you have stainless steel frets? You need no special tools for stainless steel frets. Just stainless steel frets are harder, so they wear on your tools more. So when you hear somebody say, I don't have the tools for that, they're usually, they're misspeaking or they just don't want to tell you the truth, but usually they're misspeaking. Um, it's kind of like when we say truss rod, break a truss rod, but really you kind of crack it. You know, you don't break it. You know, it kind of just strips out, right? Or cracks off. So, it's, you know, you crack a truss rod. You don't really, I know that's kind of silly to talk that way, but um, stainless steel frets. No, so everything's stainless steel. I work on stainless steel all the time and uh, it just wears your tools a little bit more. And that's it. So you have to replace uh, files a little faster. Um, okay. All right. I think on that note, I think I'm going to go with Janice who says, play your guitar. I think Janice is calling it. I think now we're going to go ahead and call it so we can go play guitar uh, or spend time with families. So that's probably good too. If you have if, either way, <laughs> um, we didn't have family come for Christmas because uh, our family's in uh, New Mexico and stuff. And, and just because of COVID and stuff, we just didn't do anything for Christmas this year. Uh, Steven uh, did a last super chat, so I'm going to give him that. It says, uh, installing a Floyd, how would you reinforce a Strat cavity for the for the Floyd post if you are starting to crack in the wood or the post, uh, the part, uh, are the posts start to blow out? How do you prevent this? Um, so if I had a guitar, let's just say if you brought me a guitar and you had a Floyd Rose in it, it doesn't matter if it was the original or if you installed it afterwards and I was getting where the post, you're talking about the countersinks in the guitar. If I was seeing cracks there, what I would do is I would pull the post. So I'd pull the guitar, uh, pull the bridge off, pull, you know, take the guitar apart, pull the bridge off, pull the posts so I can inspect what's going on because a lot of times the post, what's happening is they're pushing forward on the top. Okay, the bridge is pushing forward and the it's not cracking through the body. It's the paint that's cracking. So if that's the case, um, what you would do is I would, uh, well, it depends on the guitar. You know what I mean? Sometimes I have to send it somebody for finish work if it needs finish work. If it's something I can I can fill and fill and finish on the cracks myself, I'll do that. Sometimes you can do that because they're minor. Then I would uh, drill and dowel the holes and re-drill uh, um posts and put the resync the posts back in so that they have something really firm to put in there. My guess is if you're getting cracking, it's cause they're literally they're Um, again, this is kind of a little tricky. Um, I'm looking for something that illustrates this visually. Um, basically think about this. You have, you have the drilled out hole, right? It's going to be like this and the post is in there. And I'm going to say this coffee cups, the post, and this is all dumb guys, bear with me. So here's your holes, my two hands. What's happening is, is the hole's too big so that the top of the, the bridge is pushing. Do you see what I'm saying? It's pushing like this. So that's why I want to drill and fill it. You could be lazy, pull the post out and just fill it in there because there might be something in there that's filled. You wouldn't do it with glue or anything. You can use wood shavings and stuff like that. But I would drill it and dowel it. That's how I would handle it. That sounds like a pain in the ass. It probably, probably because it is, but that's what I would do. 
So um, my guess is if it's acting up, it's uh, it, you need to start with a good foundation and redo it again because it'll just continue to get worse. Those posts will just keep pushing forward, causing a bigger, bigger problem. So, um, all right. <laughs> on that note, I want to thank you guys so much for hanging out with me on this Christmas day. Like I said, if you celebrate Christmas, Merry Christmas. If you don't, happy holidays, uh, like I said, or and, uh, and uh, as my friend would say, if you're an atheist, uh, happy buying crap day. I just like that joke. He just told me this week, so I'm just sharing it. <laughs> so um, anyways, on that note, everybody I hope has a good weekend, uh, spends it with some money they love or a guitar they love. That works too. And don't forget, like Dale said, and uh, and they've said over and over again, don't forget to play guitar. As always, thank you guys so much for your time. Till next, uh, next Friday, like I said, we'll do next Friday, same time, unless, of course, Ralph agrees to do Saturday, and I'll give you guys notice of that ahead of time. Otherwise, I'll see you guys next week. All right? Know your gear.